kid I was born. OTB AM with Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. All right, it's Thursday morning. You're very welcome along. It's OTBAM. It's Jaron Shane with you all the way through until 10 this morning, as ever. We'd like to hear from you if you're a Celtic fan, if you're a Liverpool fan, if you're uh, whoever. Whoever you are this morning, we don't care. We'd like to hear from you. 087 9180 180 is the WhatsApp number. Uh, maybe you're a Chelsea fan and you're feeling yourself that um, everything is coming right for you. Uh, or maybe you're a Man City fan who's disappointed that Ernie Holland didn't get to play in the second half last night. Would he have scored five? Would he have uh, scored ten? The the opportunities for goals last night were limit were un, unlimited. Like it was just he could you could sense the disappointment from Ernie Holland as he was being taken off, and I, that was obviously it. He, he he knows he probably has a target in his head. We're all debating how many goals can he get. I bet Ernie needs to get to that number. Um, it's probably a remarkably high number, but he has remarkably high standards for himself. Um, I saw there was a petition online as well to have him removed from the Premier League because he is a robot that's gathered I think 400,000 signatures as of yet last night so maybe he is a robot and maybe that's the this is AI is. from the future yeah. it's like um, Terminator style someone from the future has planted him here as a, almost a, an experiment a social experiment um, and that's why he is so good at, at scoring goals in in this version uh, John Connor is actually his dad Yes, it's all Roy Keane's fault. Somewhere along the way, yeah, yeah, it's all Roy Keane's fault. We all know a robot's favourite food is lasagna, and it's come out since the Manchester Derby that his father cooks him lasagna before every home game. Are they trying to like humanise him a bit? And you know, is that because? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't seen that many um, ads. No, no, no. He's not like he's not a clothes horse the way Messi and Ronaldo are. True. Is yeah. that just that the that the big brands haven't caught up to him yet? Keeping his powder dry. Like, I, he must be in some bits and pieces, is he? He's in the is he in the background, but I haven't seen him being the the lead. Maybe that's it. That there's no he has no distractions. Like it, literally, his father and everyone else around him is like, well, concentrate in the football. You're only 22. All of those opportunities will come, which is which is a fair argument. But he could be making a lot more money than he is probably commercially at the minute. Yeah, I do think that Hollywood is the, is like that's the direction <laughs> this is going. I, I'm not, I'm kind of not joking. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. I robot. He, he probably needs a World Cup though. He probably needs to get to a World Cup. For it to cross over, I mean, you don't really like he doesn't. He doesn't really. He's at the most watched football club at the world in the biggest competitions in the world at the moment. But mm. you kind of like doing it at a World Cup and the next World Cup, obviously, no better place than Mexico, yeah, um, Canada, and the United States to. Um, well, well Pele had fifty eight. Maradona did eighty six. Ronaldo had no real World Cup. He had the Euros, I guess. Yeah, Messi yeah. hasn't had a World Cup as such. Uh, he did reach a final. He did reach a final, but you know, I guess you need those famous images of you lifting and the trophy. Being to... on the bench in 06 probably cost Argentina the chance. That was it. Yeah, that was yeah. their chance. You know. Yeah. Um. I. I. Maybe they don't need that at all, just in terms of the marketing. But it's like FIFA would then market. They would have rights to footage of him doing something amazing, and that would also explode, and it would be in the history books forever. So maybe, yeah. maybe that's completely irrelevant nowadays. Maybe he just needs to get on Instagram a bit more. Maybe. Maybe it's up, all up your socials. Instagram. Alan, <laughs> what's wrong with you? Yeah, and he's young too. I'm sure he's good on the on, on the gram as well. I, I, like someone on BT described him last night as a, a walking, talking cheat code, which I thought summed him up quite well. And Jack Grealish's post match interview as well last night. He like, like a bit like James Madison, very very in, interesting interviewee. Um, always love listening to Jack Grealish after a match. I missed that. What did he say? He couldn't stop smiling, and uh, he, he started saying that he, he was asked about Haaland, and he said, "I've never witnessed anything like it in my life." in terms of training and matches. And he said during the game last night, the Copenhagen keeper came up to him after maybe Haaland's second goal and said, that guy's not human. So sticking with the robot theme here, obviously the Copenhagen keeper is uh, agreeing with us. But um, yeah, it was just, uh, like he was also talking about the fact that he, he wants to add more goals to his game. Grealish was brilliant last night for City, um, which is really a good sign for Pep Guardiola as well. I'm Rick Laporte back after his surgery as well and, and played quite well, won the penalty. Um, Riyad Mahrez was talked about in advance of the game hasn't performed as he did last season has hasn't the new been, contract hasn't been picked hasn't been picked at all uh, played well last night Riyad Mahrez he only scored the penalty of course but um, back into the team so like there's no and then you see Haaland being taken off Cole Palmer coming on playing brilliantly uh, Rico Lewis and Josh Wilson Esbern as well off the bench young, two youngsters uh, and they just all looked like they just effortlessly 
seemed into that Champions League night. You know, these are kids, and yet whatever City are doing with their with their underage talent, it's um it's working because they all just merged into the game perfectly after Haaland went off. Uh, yeah, I think the fans and and every, all of us watching wanted Haaland to stay on. Um, the de- it is the death of football, though. We all, we all understand this yes. is the death of football. Except that Haaland will move on. Obviously, he's uh, he's already told everybody that his dream is to be the best striker at multiple clubs. So he'll do the tour of Real Madrid and at some point end up in PSG and the, or maybe, maybe it'll be Barcelona. Whoever it is, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, potentially. Like the the there was rumours before the game last night of of this uh, potential Real Madrid release clause in Haaland's contract. Um, and I was thinking, oh, this is just newspaper rumours. Pep was asked about it in the in the in the post match press conference, and he said there is no such there is no such clause that he thinks Haaland is enjoying his time at City. Obviously, so far. Would you tell everybody if there was? Well, you probably wouldn't. Um, but then, if it emerged that there was, you'd be like, "Well, Pep, you said there was." I know, but they, you know, I mean, that's what I said. I was doing my job. I was yeah. just following orders. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't imagine there would be a Real Madrid release clause like if Real Madrid want him, they'll just come get him in a few years' time. But um, well, there'll be a price. There will be a price. Yes, but where like we've often wondered what the ceiling is for for football transfers. Haaland is the ceiling. Like, well, uh, but Haaland's really smart, and that's what he did was he said, "I'll stay with you, Dortmund, but I will have a price that is not ridiculous, mm. so that I'll get the money instead of you getting the money." Yeah, so maybe the the release clauses won't be too ridiculous for Haaland it won't be Neymar numbers like it'll be well they're all stupid signing yeah. those contracts with the billion dollar release clause because no one's ever going to sign it yeah. it's, it's idiotic Like they, they just want to be the player with the billion dollar release clause well it sounds great, great and it's a massive boost to their egos but it's really bad for their bank balance not yeah. that their bank balance really needs puffed up any further yeah. but like there's so much uh, idiocy when it comes to negotiating these deals and you think about Harry Kane wanted to leave but couldn't leave because uh He'd, uh, he'd he'd thought that uh, they might let him go because they said they might let him go, yeah. and then they changed their minds. Well, yeah. it's, not, it's not not written in the contract. I yeah, don't, I don't see it says I can let you go here, Harry. <laughs> so we'll see. We'll see what happens. It's yeah, it's it's one of those things. Like the, um, you almost wonder with with Haaland, like that's nineteen in, goals in eleven games in Ever City. That would have been if he went on to score another hat trick last night, which he probably would have. A fourth in five home games. Like is this Pep Guardiola going right? Let's. Let's calm this down a bit. I don't want him to score a hat trick because then the, the all, is, all the headlines yeah. are there. Well, I think it, you definitely you're going to see him being managed in games. They're going to manage his minutes like an Irish rugby player from this point yeah. to the end of the season, which will which will limit how many goals he can score. And maybe if you're Pep, you're thinking I don't really want him to break Dixie Dean's record this season because if he does that, what's going to be his motivation next year? So how about I like get him to a certain point? And then start taking him off after half an hour when the game is over. <laughs> but he strikes me as someone who always just like if he scores seventy goals this season, he's going to want seventy five next season. Like he's that type of fella. Um, but if you set the record in this league, yeah, true. Do yeah. you not then go right? Who who's the Spanish league? What's that record? What did Pushka score? What did De Stefano score? I can do that. What okay, if, I'm out of here. Sorry, folks. <laughs> well, if they don't win the Champions League this year, that's obvious uh, reason to, to keep going next year. But So, the, yeah, worst case scenario, you win both the league and the Champions League yeah. and you set the record. It's like, uh, there are no other worlds for me to, to burn. <laughs> to conquer, yeah. I think, um, yeah, it's becoming more and more increasingly likely that, that City will win the Champions League this year the more I look at Haaland. So, unless he gets injured. Um, um, you know, Chelsea pretty good. Yeah, Chelsea pretty good. And, and the latter stage of the Champions League, anything can happen. But but if Haaland continues this form across the season... Leo Messi scored a good goal last night. Oh, peach for PSG. No, they ended up drawing the game with, with Benfica. But um, That group's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Benfica are excellent. Yeah. Juventus won last night, finally getting off the mark against Haifa. And so Benfica and PSG have seven points. Juve have three. Yeah. So... You they aren't out. No, no. And you would uh, think they might be able to do some damage. Well, that's, it's, it's a decent group. And um, Adrian Rabiot, the, the man that that wasn't for Manchester United, scoring a couple of goals for Juventus last night. I mean, maybe he would have been better than uh, Casemiro because he's never playing Casemiro. At least he wanted yeah. He seemed to want Rabiot. True, yeah, yeah. Um, it was his attitude that everyone was talking about. But yeah, there's it was some. Ma's th- attitude that everyone was talking about. Yeah. <laughs> it was, yeah. And, and like, I'm actually liking the way some of the groups are headed. Um, the Chelsea group is is mad. Um, like they go to the San Siro on Tuesday for the return leg now against AC Milan, and that's going to be that's going to be a fairly big game. But but the way it's set up, RB, RB Salzburg beat Dinamo Zagreb one 0 last night. I don't think there's any more than two points between top and bottom in that group. Um, so like but heading into the game last night, Chelsea couldn't afford really any more slip ups, and they get the three 0 win against AC Milan. Let's not forget AC Milan are the Serie A champions. They're playing really well at the minute as well. Um, but Chelsea were. 
electric and the atmosphere was seemed to be brilliant through the TV screens at Stamford Bridge which we haven't seen in, in quite some time um, we were talking before the game and Graham Potter was asked during the week about I think it was a style of football and, and sexy football and he says I very rarely feel sexy and he kind of spoke about how Grahams are very rarely sexy which is a fair point but apologies to any Grahams watching this morning who I mean Graham Hunter he, he's, he's a sexy well man. sorry Graham yeah, yeah, he'd be an exception if Graham Hunter's watching then he's definitely one of the uh, one of the sexy Grahams but there there are yeah it's just one of those names that you, that you just uh don't, don't, don't associate it with it but I think so, he had the roll neck jumper on last night the black roll neck jumper one of the newspapers described Graham Potter as the milk tray man uh, today uh, which I thought was a good good reference he, he he's looking the part I don't think he tried this hard on the sidelines of the Amex I mean is that the same jumper that Pep wears essentially yeah I don't know if it was a full turtle neck or if it was the I don't know what the difference in a roll neck and a turtle neck is but, but it was yeah it was pretty high he had um, a blazer on too he did yeah, he properly looked the part um, so that like that that maybe that's part of his plan that look, Champions League night, Europe. Let's look. Clouds make it the man, right? It does. And uh, look, he proved he was up to it last night because that's a big game for Chelsea, big win. Uh, Clothes make it the man. As somebody who's been in touch to say, Irish Eye says Shane maybe wearing a skin coloured T-shirt under an open shirt while on camera isn't a great idea. I mean, you say that <laughs> Irish Eye. Is is it, it's salmon coloured. Unless my skin is salmon. That's it. It, it, it does looks, look. I'm just looking at the camera right. Yeah, yeah it's quite similar. You're to, kind of washed out by the the lighting here. Yeah, uh, my mother would be telling me now Shane you, you should have worn a, a darker coloured t-shirt now but thank you for the fashion advice uh, I'll take it on board and uh, take he, he's, he's just trying to um, to get you excited this morning Irish eyes you know <laughs> just, to, just to show a little bit I'll try harder the rest of your imagination maybe I'll wear a roll neck jumper in one of the mornings um, Graham Potter style on the Champions League days uh, Shane says two months into the new season and I've already grown tired of the Hall and narrative sports washing works like mm. come on lie back and feel the sports washing wash over you because that's what's happening like yeah, you forget it. As we said the other morning, you forget it with Man City. Uh, with Newcastle, it's obvious. With PSG, it's obvious. Um, but when we talk about City, we never mention the Qataris, which which we which we should, do you know. <laughs> well, I, I missed the football last night. I was at a, a debate, and the debate was uh, this house would boycott the World Cup. And, um, but, oh, what do you think? Yeah. What, you? As in boycott it, as in not watch it? Um, well, it was to be to be decided. You get to pick, right? You see, it's an awkward one for football fans because, like, what do you what do you do? Like, it, the games are being shown on TV. The TV uh, stations are, do, are are showing it. It's almost like it's like the the climate discussion. You know, you feel like you're doing nothing. You know, oh, I'm not going to get that flight, but, but that's a very small thing. The flight's going to go anyway. The World Cup's going to happen anyway without us. Do we watch it? Do we feel bad about watching it? Should we not feel bad about watching it? Um, at least we're talking about it and the horrific human rights abuses and, and mentioning them and highlighting them. Maybe it's not enough. Maybe we should be doing more and, and, and boycotting it in en masse. Uh, but you, you kind of need the, the organisations, the footballing organisations around the world to, to be, like the, the national organisations to be doing something about this because it's it's not really up for me and you and Joe Soap at home watching to to do this but it, yeah it, our own personal morality is is influenced by what we do um, yeah w- w- there's a little bit of that like a little bit of that is us saying well actually it's somebody else's job to fix this and so always with anything with any protest movement it's like well what can I do as an individual all you can do as an individual is try and get more people to be aware and rally behind and then try and get some moral authority when it comes to talking about it yeah like everybody's a hypocrite if you drill down at some point in all of our lives on all points really there's very few individuals who are entirely consistent the whole way through yeah. following whatever it is that they, they do so when it comes to this like the sports washing you know the what about her kicks in immediately well what about America's mm. uh, human rights what about America's doping what about blah blah blah, blah. and uh, you're like well they're all you know pretty good points like where does uh, it end well um, the illegal invasion of Iraq has led to the situation in the Middle East that is like it has bred Al Qaeda. It's like, you know, uh, it, it's very easy to trace everything back to a point where, like, at that point you do nothing, yeah, right? and you you take no stand. But they're sports fans definitely have way more power than they think. Mm. If you consider how quickly sports fans were able to bring down the European Super League, or sorry, postpone the European Super League, uh, they do actually have power and there could be something that happens at the World Cup. There could be something that makes everybody go, right, 
I, that's one side of it. The other side of it is like, what about um, the 1968 Olympics and the Black Power salute? Like, what happens if, what happens if Leo Messi wears rainbow laces? Now, Messi's been sponsored of the yin yang by yeah. Uh, is it Qatar or it's some some group anyway? He's taken the money. Um, Barcelona have taken the money uh, through Qatar Airways. David Beckham, as we know, he's taken a lot. Soon of money. to be Sir David because he queued for fifteen hours. Yeah, he's taken the money, loads and loads and loads of money. But what happens if somebody scores and reveals afterwards they're gay at the World Cup in Qatar? Like that'd be a massive moment. Yeah, right. It'd be so, a cultural cultural moment. Yeah, so they shouldn't boycott. And yeah. what, you know, I don't know. It's a, it's a very tricky. No, it's a fair point. A, an interesting. Like your teams yeah. walk off a team that's that's either qualified already for for a group stage or or that's already knocked out. Do they walk off the pitch, and protest at some point? Um, I can't see a team walking off when there's something at stake in a World Cup match. Um, but maybe yeah, maybe it does take. Maybe the Danes are like rope it open us. They're like oh, nothing on our kit, no sign from Hummel, yeah. and then they're gonna like just lay down after the first game. And be like, yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah. Do you know? I don't know. It'll take someone to to step up and, and be the. And somebody the else made the excellent point that like having a bunch of journalists wandering around in Qatar, it's gonna be interesting to see what they can find. You know, yeah. when they're away from the football, not re- not just reporting on the football. So it's a big challenge to them to go and actually actively report about what the situation on the ground is like and. Um, Highlight that to the rest of the world. Well, it's, it's going to be the first World Cup in a long time where there are going to be, going to be news journalists as well as sports journalists covering it in tandem, you'd imagine. Um, because obviously there's going to be sports journalists sent over by organisations to cover solely the sport. And the same organisations where the budget allows will be sending news journalists to cover the darker side of it, which I think is the, maybe the right way to do it. Um, you know, if budget allows, a lot of these these organisations should be sending people over to kind of cover the, uh, the, the the dark, which is a very dark side, by the way, of it, because uh, some of us don't realise how ingrained this goes. Like, it's just been, it's, a, it's like a pop-up shop World Cup where all these stadiums have just been popped up. Pe- people have been dying in the creation of them as well. And Yeah, now, where was the last World Cup? In 2018. Yeah, well, the Russians, yeah. You know? I know. I mean, Conor McGregor and Vladimir Putin weren't were they together at the at the World Cup? I final? think that was at the World Cup, wasn't it? Wasn't that posing together? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Football follows the money. Um, yeah, it, he'd already it, taken Crimea at that point. Yeah, and football didn't give a shit, and the rest of the world were like, oh, oh, like I mean, I certainly bought the narrative, like oh, maybe the cultural exchange here is going to help all these all these foreign people coming in and talking to the nice Russians is going to teach the nice Russians how to, it's, it's all bollocks it, yeah. it doesn't work anyway 0879180180 is the WhatsApp number if you've got a view on that we'd love to hear from you you can uh, get in touch by leaving a comment on the YouTube stream and we're brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish today here's what's coming up between now and uh, 10 o'clock this morning uh, Mark Wilson is going to join us to talk about Celtic last night not a great Celtic performance not a classic European night in Celtic's history Johnny Pilkington is going to join us at half past eight Alan Mangan is going to join us at 8.50 to talk about the state of uh, Westmeath hurling and just how important a victory uh, yeah, in the club can mean for um, different clubs and what a breakthrough is actually going to mean. Not a bad time to be involved in Westmeath hurling. Mm-hmm. And Israel Alatunde, um, Shane has spoken to Israel about the fantastic season he's having and we'll also play out with Wednesday Night Rugby uh, a little bit later on as well. Uh, JP Wright says, I was a season ticket holder at Salzburg when Haaland was there. He was phenomenal. Um, yeah, it, it has been. This has been brewing for a little while. <laughs> and uh, E. McGov says James McCarthy played last night. Who was the last Irish player to play in the Champions League outfield prior? Are we including Champions League qualifiers that, um, like, uh, Irish clubs might have been in? This might have, so fair. I uh, wonder does the does the texter have an answer? <clears throat> I was like, is this a Darren O'D? Is that one of those situations? Is that like? Column has it, is he? No. no, no. Sorry, put you on the spot there. That's a that's a good question. That's a that's a quiz one now. James McCarthy is. It's not John O'Shea. Is Katie it? McCabe is a fair shout from Emma outside. Yeah. Um, John O'Shea. It wouldn't be as far back as O'Shea, would it? Surely not. Maybe. Yeah, it's been. Is there anybody else at Celtic? Aidan McGeady. Yeah, McGeady. He's been, been since. There's probably someone really obvious more recently. Um, you'd miss those days. You would miss those days where you had Damien Duff lighting it up for Chelsea, Steve Finnan on the right flank for Liverpool, John O'Shea in the uh, probably playing goals or right miss back. Miss those or, days when we used to be good. Yeah, yeah back in the day. Um, but there were Irish players at least in the Championship last night lighting it up. Yeah, go on. Doing some decent, doing some decent bits. Um, Will Keane on the score sheet. Uh, I think Wigan unfortunately lost that game. However, but uh, 
Yeah, and and I was I was chatting before the game. Preston beating um or before the show, Preston beating West Brom one nil. Uh, Jakobsen with a goal. But if you look at the lineups uh, for Preston, especially Greg Cunningham in the defence for Preston, Alan Brown on the right flank, Robbie Brady in the centre. Robbie Brady playing midfield, it looks like. Yeah. Starting next to, I'm, I'm on live score. Was it, yeah, and the same. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sean Maguire up front, and then um, um, Brown was replaced after 68 minutes. Brady came off as well, and Maguire came off. And Troy Parrott came on with five minutes uh, to play in that game. So there was a serious bit of Irish interest in that match. We have to go all the way back to Tuesday. For the last Irish player to play in the Champions League, you have the answer. Oh no, he didn't play Tuesday. No, he didn't. It's like the previous game, two weeks ago. Two Who's weeks the answer? Ago. Sorry, I didn't hear it. Who was it? Matt Doherty. Ah, oh, Matt Doherty. Sure. Sorry, Matt. Yeah, yeah. Of course. I was thinking that there might be someone obvious that we hadn't. Can we? Can we, can we? Uh, Antonio uh, Conte has has. We can't change. Somebody started obviously because James McCarthy didn't start. Yeah. True. Um, yeah, but uh, Jason Malumbi, by the way, I should mention was. I'm sure Matt Doherty came off the bench two weeks ago. Do we? He did, didn't he? Yeah. All right. Yeah. So Irish interest and um, the, oh. the 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 Preston. Um, the, the, if you look at the state of the championship table, sorry, look, sorry, look at the state of Preston's goal difference. They've played twelve games in the championship chair so far. They've scored four goals and they've conceded four goals. How is that humanly possible? Well, it's possible because they have a, a rake of nil-nil draws in there. Like Swansea are, are a few places ahead of them in sixth in the, in the table. They're also on zero goal difference, but I think they've scored 15, conceded 15 in the 12 games, which is more of a realistic number. But yeah, Preston are a, are a weird, weird outfit this season. With them, um, But they were glad to get the win, obviously, last night. Uh, with plenty of Irish interest. Giddo's Yogbenya played 90 minutes as well for Rotherham against Millwall. Um, there was some Irish interest. Troy Park didn't start. Came off the bench for came off the Preston. bench for Preston. Yeah, um, Johnny McGuire is getting in ahead of him. Yeah, interesting that. Uh, Not great for Troy. <coughs> shows the packing order at the club. Jason Malumbi and Darrow Shea were on the pitch as well, starting for for West Brom in that game. So yeah. Malumbi was only off the bench last at the weekend, so that's good that he's back starting. Yeah, yeah. At least there's some some Irish players getting some proper game time in the championship, and of course Jeff Hendrick the night before with his first goal for Reading. So decent. Um, Ronaldo. Obviously, uh, is in the papers today again because Eric Ten Hag mentioned him in response to a question, and this is how it works. Mm. Uh, Ten Hag said he's pissed off that he's not playing, and so therefore all the papers are talking about it. I'll give you the headlines in just a second. But um, in stark contrast, uh, Lionel Messi last night, oh. as we said, scored a great goal. The stack came through. Um, Kathleen had this pre pre show. Uh, Benfica last night was the fortieth different club <laughs> that he has scored against in the Champions League. That's ridiculous. That is just ridiculous. You better go and see him fast, Shane. I know, I know. I need to take oh, him off the list. Time is passing and running and running and passing. You the better get it right this time. The other stat that they, they popped up last night in BT was Haaland to score, the quickest to score uh, this amount of goals in the Champions League since, um, I think like that even Ronaldo, Messi, they were all like 106 games to get to this point. He's just, he's breaking all records all around him. It's, it's actually scandalous what he's doing, so... We'll uh, run out of superlatives pretty quickly. The Irish Times, Hart's error proves costly as Celtic slumped to defeat in Leipzig. What did Joe Hart do? Well, basically, it was a pass out from the back that uh, well, that, that I thought at the time he shouldn't have given uh, for, for one of the, the Leipzig goals. But he said in the interview afterwards, he was like, well, that's the, that's the way we're told to play. Play out from the back. That's the um, way we're told to play. It's not my fault. Yeah, that was, was there a bit of that? For, for half a second, he was, he was. It sounded like that, and then he said, "Well, it was, it was a bad pass as well." He was a bit tetchy in the, the post match interview. I have to say, fair play to, to Hart for at least fronting up and, and coming out in front of the press. But um, yeah, he, he didn't cover himself in glory, and it was disappointing for Celtic. The style of play that Ange uh, uh, deploys, at least it's exciting, and you know, watching a Celtic game, you're going to get excitement and, and a bit of a thrill. But um, in Europe, it mightn't work. Strachan was kind of defending it to some degree last night. Paul Lambert was kind of saying maybe they need to, to adapt and, and overcome in terms of European games to get results. But it'll be interesting to see that they've two home games up next before the trip to the Bernabeu in the last game. So um, they probably just have to stick with it, especially at home in the atmosphere at Celtic Park. Can they get six points from six in the next two games and keep their chances of progressing alive? We will see. But um, yeah. Decent, decent uh, result for Leipzig. There's match previews of um, Shamrock Rovers at Malda tonight uh, in all the papers. The assembled Irish soccer journalists are over in Norway. Uh, Rovers face daunting task as they enter Solskjaer's Malda then is um, the headline on the Irish Times. And, uh, there's similar ones across all the papers today. So we'll be talking about that. And, um, flying form, Aubameyang. Aubameyang, you know, uh, everything's going good. Aubameyang is good. Yeah. Everything's going bad. Do you want Aubameyang in the trenches? I'm not so sure. But, you know, things are good. Potter, as you said, the Neil Trayman. Everything's working out. We haven't talked about this yet. Ben versus Eubank thrown into chaos by drug test. 
Uh, so they had to do an explainer on the fertility drug that has shown up in the VADA samples. Clomiphene, yeah. Um, you know, I mean, if, if, if a sports person tells us that they're clean, we should just leave it at that. Why can't we just... Why can't we just trust people anymore? What <laughs> happened to us that made us so cynical? Yeah. He says he's clean. The other tests are clean. He must be clean. He, he came out... Like, it's not like you can do damage to another human being in the ring. He can't. No, it's of like, course. That's the, that's, the, that's the scary thing about this. Tiddly winks. Yeah. It's, uh, it really highlights the, the disgusting nature of professional boxing if this fight does go ahead. Uh, like, really interested to hear Conor Ben and Eddie Hearn at the open sparring session they had yesterday after this news came out. And Ben's language was... He came out swinging in some ways, but his language was, was very interesting. He was like, I haven't failed a test, which so far is, is untrue. You, you did fail a test. Your, your A sample was positive for, for clomiphene. Um, he says, I'm not suspended. That's true. Fair yeah, enough. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so he was using all these uh, kind of phrases that Eddie Hearn obviously maybe planted as the, the PR guy in the background uh, for him to say. But this fight could be worried, even if the British Boxing Board of Control decides to pull the plug. They have other avenues. As Gavin Casey said in the show last night, the Luxembourg Board of Control might decide to throw their weight behind it or any other country's boxing board of control to, to let, let the fight go ahead. A lot of people stand to lose a lot of money if this fight doesn't go ahead as planned on Saturday night in the O2 Arena. So um, you can see why e like even Eubank Jr. was quite happy, he said, for, for the fight to go ahead and accepted that the Clomiphene wasn't taken for performance-enhancing reasons, quote-unquote. So, um, yeah, you'd, you'd raise eyebrows with that because obviously they want this fight to go ahead for for more than just boxing reasons. There's a lot of money at stake here too. So Somebody on Twitter found an amazing clip of uh, Eddie Hearn saying, what's the point in doing drug testing if when somebody tests positive, you're just going to let the fight go ahead and say the test didn't matter anyway? Yeah, and it, and it was, it, it's, it's a good point. It was through the voluntary um, testing scheme that, that caught the, the positive sample from Conor Ben, which apparently cost them £30,000 to do to, 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 to do for a big fight so yeah. what's the point in paying the 30 grand if you're not going to listen to their and it, results he, he was specifically talking about VADA as well this is the best one in the world as far as I'm concerned yeah. if they find you guilty you're guilty and now it's like well you know the British Boxing Board of Control tests of uh, found a medicine so look uh, you'd have to say that there's a lot of money at stake for the uh, people concerned and so therefore you would expect the fight to go ahead even if it's not sanctioned well, right? where's, where's this B sample let's let's have a look at the B sample we all know that the B sample it, it, in many cases over the years the B sample is the same as the A sample so uh, maybe that's why they don't want to release it before the fight because obviously that, that would kind of rubber stamp the the fact that this yes very much is a positive positive case of, of clomiphene and that would Probably cancel the fight regardless ahead of Saturday. So maybe it's as you say, like it's 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 too close to the fight. A lot of people have bought tickets. There's a lot of vested interest in this. There's a lot of money riding on it. But uh, as you say, two human beings are going to get into a ring and punch each other in the head. Um, and if one of them is taking a performance enhancing drug, then um, that's a concern, and the fight should not go ahead. Uh, Aubameyang will revert to type eventually. Says uh, twenty years ago. Uh, Martin Farris says Killian Sheridan lads played in the Champions League a few years uh, back yeah. Eamon Madden's not having me saying that City are the most watched club in the world uh, Jared, well, they're going to play in like all the big games all season long so like all the Man United fans are going to watch Man City because they're going to watch that game all the Liverpool fans are going to watch Man City because they're going to watch that game all of the Real Madrid and Barcelona fans when they end up playing in the Champions League quarters, semis and finals like they're going to be in the biggest games all season long as they have been for many of the last number of years they might not have the biggest fan base but they're in all of the biggest games. Like, yeah. Okay, and if they're the, the, if the viewing figures for Manchester City would be like slightly behind one of the other big clubs in the world, but they're pretty close to it this stage. He's going to be able to become globally famous. I mean, I'm talking against myself here, but not having to play in a World Cup, but it would be good. And get to Hollywood. Good. Get to Hollywood, yeah. Um, I should mention as well this morning, Ger, the I have a clip to, to bring people of um, my excursion. I mentioned it last week as well on the show to uh, Mondello Park. First time to Mondello Park. Did you feel it in your arse? I did feel it in my arse. You, you can absolutely feel it. Like Jess, just for anybody who's, uh, you know, wondering where my question came from, Jess McFadden was on the show last week. Yeah. She was driving a Formula 4 as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She yeah. was driving though. She was, sorry, yeah, yeah, of course. She was driving and she said that um, the drivers explain in Formula 1 when you're accelerating that you feel it in your arse. <laughs> she didn't say that. She was very polite. Yes. Now, mine was a, it was a, it was a Porsche Cayman. <clears throat> um, lovely car. Not What's quite that? as fast as a as a Formula 4 car well, it's just one of the road, road cars essentially but not exactly built for speed but it's a very like it's a fast car That's what I, that was Alex Dunn's words oh, yeah, it's not as you know, it's not built for speed but. just explain who Alex Dunn is again 
So Alex Dunn is a Formula 4 driver from Clonbelogue in Cardiophily. He's 16 years of age. He doesn't actually have a licence yet. Doesn't have a driving licence. Um, so he's, he's after sewing up the British Formula 4 championships. He's in the running for the Italian Formula 4 championships. He's at the... Um, He's in, in Monza this weekend, uh, taking part in, in one of the races there. He's already been testing Formula 3 cars. He's been signed up to the Ferrari School of Excellence, or their academy of drivers for next year, which is, which only elite kind of young drivers are, are brought into. Um, could be Ireland's next Formula 1 driver. Now, there's a lot of ifs and buts between now and then, because obviously there's fin- finances at play. Uh, you need sponsorship, and he's kind of getting sponsorship and building a name up for himself at the minute. But a, a fantastic talent. Uh, I don't think we've had a, an Irish driver in Formula 1 since Eddie Irvine potentially so um, yeah <clears throat> this is a clip of me uh, the full, we'll have the full interview on, on OTB AM next week so I sat down with him after the after the interview I couldn't like we, we actually went round for a couple of laps and then the guys uh, with Alex had a GoPro set up in front of the camera or in front of the car which they hadn't turned on at the start so after the interview they came to us and said oh lads we have to go around and do a few more laps and Alex was buzzing he was so happy that he got to do a few more laps in the car Um I was a little bit nervous, but but to be honest, I, I actually really enjoyed it. Um, he, he's just one of these, his attitude, like, he, I think you have to be cocky to be a, a driver at that, at that level, and he's definitely, there's a little modicum of cockiness, which I, which I really, really like. Uh, like he was, at one point I was filming him in the car and he said, can you send me those, can you send me those videos after? I've, I've never seen myself, you know, from that angle, kind of driving cars from that angle. So he was very interested in that element of it. Uh, but yeah, this is a 90 second teaser of uh, me getting uh, dragged wow. around Mon- Mondello Park by Alex Dunn. Nice and warm. I'm not nervous at all. <laughs> Maybe now a little bit. I don't know if you remember Michael Dara McCauley's interview after they won the All Ireland. Unbelievable! Unbelievable! <laughs> you were you had your Michael Dara head yeah, on you there. That was my moment. Uh, that's the Porsche Cayman. I know you're not going to be able to see that, but you can see that like, it's the classic Porsche shape. Yeah, Porsche Cayman S. Yeah, it was na- black. named after the island, of course, that you need to have a bank account in if you can afford it. Yes, yes, for sure. And and like he was, we looked at the tires afterwards, and there was certainly plenty of degradation on those tires because he wasn't taking it easy. It was it, when we first pulled out, pulled pulled off. Obviously, I, I I forgot that we were in the pit lane, and he was going pretty fast. And I was like, "Oh, here we go!" And then he left the pit lane and obviously accelerated remarkably um, more. And I was like, "Oh, this is this is how fast we're going to go." Okay, and uh, obviously around the bends, I mean, is the is where it gets pretty hairy and pretty interesting. But um, an incredible talent for sixteen years of age, confidence in spades does uh, Alex don't have, and I'm going to be following his career now. I'm going to look back on that in ten years' time when he's twenty six and. And I'm old. World champion. When he's Formula One world champion, and say, yeah, he, he drove me around in a in a lovely Porsche one day. So, uh, an incredible talent, and, and someone that 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 um, has the head for it. I think. I think you have to have the head for it when you when you're a talent in in a sport like that, and, and he certainly has it. We'll play that out next week, and um, we're planning a trip back down to Mandela for all of us to do um, a little bit of. Uh fast driving ourselves anyway four minutes past eight this morning make sure that you're um, tuned into the evening show tonight they'll keep you up to date on how things are going in the World Cup playoff between Scotland and Austria uh, kick off is at 7.35 um, and it's on in Hampden Park uh, all the narrative around this is like 
oh, Scotland are going to get the opportunity to make amends for missing out on the Euros. Finally, this team is reaching a peak and it'll be devastating for them if they don't make the World Cup. It'll really set football back in Scotland a long way. And they're like, oh, OK, so it's going to be exactly the same as us. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? And then the Austrians come along and, you know, party yeah. poop by just being excellent and boring. Yeah, well, Kathleen McNamee saying in the production meeting that, that um, Scotland is probably the, the result that Ireland want marginally not just geographically speaking because it's handier to get over there but, and a bit of crack over in, in, in Glasgow for the match but familiarity with the players um, which is a fair point as well I guess a lot of these girls in the Irish team will be will be familiar with the, the Scottish players um, oh there's so much riding on it I know that the Irish team will be watching the game tonight in the Castle Knock in the hotel it's going to be nervy Sweaty Pam's watching the game like that tonight because no matter who you play you know that you've got a massive massive game in next Tuesday like I know yeah you, you haven't started planning for it I mean I'm sure they've done some I'm sure the research is already done yeah, like, yeah for either there'll be tonight's game to go through and see whether any wrinkles in formation any wrinkles in performance any bookings anybody you know uh, not playing as a result of suspension like definitely we want a massive brawl that's what we want six players suspended from both sides yeah yeah uh, yeah I'd never wish injury on anyone but a mass brawl would be no 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 injuries be, just a brawl yeah a brawl is what you want um, one of those Dublin Galway events where you have people sent off in, in just Meath Mayo large numbers sorry Meath Mayo that's the bigger one um, yeah so watching that nervously tonight be interested to see but yeah the game is coming around so quickly today is Thursday and the game is on Tuesday so you forget that it's it, there's all this talk about Ireland in the World Cup and it is literally just days away now till we find out whether, whether we're going to be there a trip to Australia is on the cards if we manage to make it it's uh, six minutes past eight this morning uh, is Irish dancing is, is it a sport have you seen this story we were trying to talk with, yeah we were talking about this in the office this morning um, how cheating claims are rocking the world of Irish dancing that's the front page of the Irish Independent and it's like pages two and three so it's a big big story it's the front it's the lead on the mail this morning as well Colm says it's theatre Irish th- dancing hit by results fixing claims well if there's an outcome and there's a competition and there's athletic it's based on athletic uh, teachers allegedly offered inducements to judges via text messages yeah apparently there's whatsapp messages uh, incriminating whatsapp messages allegedly that um, yes just suggest fixing competitions and fixing results and kind of swapping from competition to competition who's going to win what bizarre um, thoroughly bizarre Uh, I'd also have Irish dancing by the way definitely done, done as a sport in my eyes in terms of physical endurance and endeavour um, um, after after the fishing world was uh, rocked by a uh, scandal at the weekend, now Irish dancing, what's next? We've had chess. Then I ask you, what's next? And chess? Yeah, yeah. We've had anal beads. Rumours of anal beads and chess. and uh, the Was it sexual favours inducements in this? Yeah, 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 yeah. The fish? Just lead weights. Yeah, yeah, a little less uh, interesting. But it's, yeah, all these sports are... Uh, they're kind of the sports that you always thought that, okay we need to juice these sports up and make them a little bit sexier so we can talk about them more often um, pr- maybe this isn't the way to go about it cheating scandals but um, yeah it's a mad story and by right has taken the front page of the Irish Independent because there's a lot of detail in it and a lot of they've obviously waited for, for quite some time to build up the, the army of evidence um, so yeah it's a it's a strange one uh, like <laughs> I don't know where, like where does this end I mean it, it it seems to be widespread. It's it's not just a, a one or two people kind of... That these are WhatsApp groups that are literally just back and forth deciding the outcome of events, which... Um, a school with a reputation for success can generate more in fees. So right, yeah, so there's, it there's financial comes, incentive. It all comes down to the money. It's always down to money, isn't it? Um, yeah, so that's, that's one of the juicy stories in the paper this morning, for sure. Uh, I don't know where it ends. But it, it, it's kind of up there with the chess one for me. Um, the chess one was more individual. It was kind of one player that was that was deemed to be doing a lot of cheating, and Magnus Carlsen wasn't happy. But this, this is uh, this is Irish interest and seems to be on a more of a widespread scale, which which adds to the intrigue as well. Yeah. So um, I I can't wait for the Netflix documentary about that. <laughs> Inevitably, yeah. Somebody somewhere must be making a documentary about Irish dancing and thinking. This is all a bit boring, isn't it? Like, there's not there's not very much here. Okay, you know, there's a little bit of rivalry, and then boom. All of a sudden, this happens. You're like, "Wow, it's yeah. gonna be an Oscar." Yeah, there's there certain things that happen that you're like, "Oh, that's that's a documentary waiting to happen. That's a that's a movie waiting to happen." Like, remember the two girls? Remember off the Galway coast last year who were who were saved? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I was thinking, that's a that's a movie. Damien Brown, I was thinking, didn't, yeah, wasn't that's a the movie. guy who saved them? Didn't he save somebody else as well? Wasn't he involved in? There was some, oh yes, yeah, sorry, yeah, 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 yeah. 
Uh, so the, the, there are certain things that happen in, in Irish culture and Irish news that you're thinking, yeah. Yeah, if this happened in a small town in America, they'd be like, you'd be all, all Hollywooded up. Well, yeah. that's the thing. Is that somebody <laughs> would write a story about it and say they were like, ah, jeez, nobody remembers that. It turns out they will be. Yeah. It's nine minutes past eight. Other big managerial news. Uh, Xabi Alonso will be taking his suits to the sideline at Bayer Leverkusen. This is his first gig. Yeah, yeah. Um, Raf Hasnut will get in the sack, according to all the papers this morning. It hasn't actually happened yet, but the new owner is like, hey, not my guy. Yeah, and a uh, bit of a... Steve Cooper has a stay of execution, it seems, as well, not against yeah, Forrest. Yeah, uh, you would definitely have said that Steve Cooper was about to win the sack race, but Raph hasn't it? Uh, just ducking down at the line, he'll, oh, no, it's me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Julian Lopetegui got the sack last night as well. Yeah, from, from so he, he's so. available. Um, Wolves come knocking next, maybe. Well, yeah, or, like, yeah, or Pochettino, where, where's he going to go? Yeah. Uh, maybe he's not going to go to a super club, maybe he wants to rebuild his reputation as somebody who can take a club and a project and, and manage it properly. And then Park Joyce yes. is re-signing just for... Say that. Three more years. Yeah, give him three more years, of course. Uh, an absolute legend. Um, yeah, it's strange. I didn't even realise that his, the contract was was up for negotiation. But obviously, there was, there was no, there was going to be no um, issues as to giving him more time at, at the helm. Because I love the way he, from the outset, was like, "Yeah, we, we want to win the All Ireland with Galway." There was, there's no this cutearism in, in Galway. It was just, "This is my plan. This is what I want to achieve." Can they go a step further next year? I don't know. You look at the dubs getting stronger. Kerry have the experience now of getting over the line. Um, cut the kind of championship isn't getting any easier. Kev McStay is in there now to to kind of spice things up a little bit in the kind of championship. Um, Ross Common still waiting for the new manager. Yeah, well, remains to be seen. Yeah, uh, they so can do with the manager there, lads. Come on, get the finger <laughs> out. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, fair play to Port Joyce. Uh, 11 minutes past 8 this morning during the ads you're going to hear a clip from All-Ireland winning Dublin footballer Lauren McGee and her father Johnny also a former dub who sat down to discuss how sport has shaped their relationship and learnings from life it's all part of Gillette Labs Passing It On series Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day we're back after the break <clears throat> with the former Celtic defender Mark Wilson on another tough night in the Champions League for Ange Postacoglu's side back after this OTB AM This is OTB Sports Radio. Have you subscribed to the OTB Football Podcast? Pat Nevin last night was talking about Liverpool and the Rails. I gave him, we were tight for time, one question about Liverpool. I was picking out, you know, different aspects. And he said, you know, I just think the way their midfield is at the moment, the smart, I, I know Jurgen loves that formation. Just watch, next couple of weeks, I think he'll go 4-2-3-1. 24 hours later. Less than 24. So imagine how brilliantly Nevin must see the game. Subscribe now to the OTB Football Podcast stream wherever you get your podcasts and download the OTB Sports app. I know a lot of people sometimes, not that they regret putting in the time, but they do look back and they're like, God, like, I could have did this, this and this and that type of stuff. Um, Do you have any? Oh, I I suppose the... um... No, no regrets in terms of the sacrifice, the GA. Like, I suppose the, I probably let it consume my life. Um, probably, you know, I, I suppose I would have struggled in terms of, um, look, I'm dyslexic, you know, would have struggled in school. Um, I was one of the kids that I dealt to, to the, the reading teacher and, um, not to struggle numerically and uh, verbally in terms of uh, you know numbers and, and alphabetically in terms of like spellings and reading and everything else and times tables and then like you know it became look it became ever knows they always got a football in school and you know then the principal at the time um you know I remember he wasn't too happy because I didn't know I think well, I can't remember what times tables it was and uh, and then. That afternoon we went and played football. I played a schools match and like I was playing above myself. I was in four classes playing for the junior team. We were fifth, and um, I got man the match or something. And he came over and he, he apologised for how he treated me in class later on. And I suppose the the big thing I probably did struggle with, uh, you know, with was I suppose the it was the only thing I ever recognised I was good at. Um, I would have, it was the only thing I felt that was, that I was only, uh, in terms of, you know, co- or, you know, not going to college, doing my leave and start, um, I suppose afterwards, I suppose that was, that was a huge regret in terms of not going and expressing that, but I think the, trying to deal with, with the, with, with the loss of GA, um, 
I know when I when I first played with Dublin and came aboard, you know, that was uh it was like a death. Yeah. You know, I suppose and really struggled, uh, I suppose. So that in terms of sacrifice at the time, I you know, I, I would have lived and breathed it, um, you know, probably too much at times and and, and not concentrate on, on on in terms of work life and stuff. Um and felt it owed me at times, um, and it didn't, you know. And I suppose I, I got caught up, in, you know, was, um, feeling sorry for uh, myself in terms of, you know, that I didn't get what I wanted out out of the game and getting angry then and stuff. And so, but it's kind of struggled massively in terms of the the, the, the aftermath of, of finishing up playing. OTB AM with Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. Yeah, really amazing stuff there from Johnny McGee talking about his dyslexia as a child and the impact that football had on his life and both the positive and negative out there in conversation with his daughter, Lauren. That um, series has led to just some really, really interesting conversations. Michael Carruth and his daughter had a really interesting one as well. It's amazing the honesty that you can have sometimes when your kids ask you questions. Um, so make sure you stay tuned to our social channels for the rest of that interview. It's 16 minutes past eight. OTBAM is brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Now, uh, disappointment for Celtic last night. Uh, Mark Wilson is with us to talk to us again. Mark, you're very welcome back. How are you? Oh, good. Thank you. Thanks for having me back. What happened last night, do you think? It, 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 it wasn't the same quality of performance that we'd seen from Celtic, say, uh, in the first game against Real Madrid. What, what was it that was letting them down last night that they weren't able to affect their own game plan um, in the way that we've kind of come to expect them to? Well, I think, obviously, when you're going into these games and you're missing big players as Celtic were last night, particularly two centre-halves, then you start a wee bit on the back foot now, that's not to say Stephen Welsh did anything wrong. I thought Jens was a, a little bit shaky in the opening exchanges, and that led to Leipzig having a few clear-cut chances early on in the game. I did think, however, that Celtic got to grips with the game in the first half, and they actually took it to, to Leipzig. I thought they, they played quite well up to a stage. But it was the same old problems again last night for Celtic in the, in the final third, where they created so many chances at that period that they were on top. And they didn't take one of them. And we know, again, at this level, I sound like a, a bit of a broken record here, but at this level, if you keep missing those chances, teams will punish you if you play so open. And at that time in the game, Celtic were open. They were committing bodies forward, which is great to watch. You know, they commit midfielders and wide players into the box to try and create as many opportunities as possible. And when you do that, of course, you leave yourself wide open at the back. And that's where the counter-attack goal came from. Knocked the stuffing out of Celtic for for a wee bit, um, and they find themselves chasing the game again. I did think they got to grips with it, obviously, and then the second half they came out and start fantastically well. But the game just got away from them again, and Leipzig like are a good team. Um, Celtic found it difficult, but again, it's it's the levels you go up. It's it's hard to compete at this level if you're not on top of your game. The the style of play, Mark, seems to be the big the big discussion point coming out of last night's game, and. Maybe in Europe it doesn't quite work as well as, as it does in the Scottish Premiership, but does does Ange need to have a, a different plan or a plan B? I know Jurgen Klopp, for example, changed, changed formation during the week um, in the Champions League as well. Like As you say, it leaves them open, leaves them vulnerable. On, on the flip side of that, you know, it creates a lot of chances for Celtic. They just didn't just take them last night, but is there a question to be had there over the style of play in Europe especially? especially? I think so. I think the manager has to take some of the the responsibility for that. Now, look, there's no getting away from the way Celtic play and what Ange Postacoglu has done for the club in terms of transformation. And it's it's exciting to watch week in, week out. It's exciting to watch the Champions League games. For a neutral, it must be a joy to watch because you know you're getting goals in it. But uh, I feel there's got to be a balance there somewhere. Uh, you mentioned yourself there, even Jurgen Klopp has changed his style. You know, the top teams adapt in this competition because they know they're coming up against the elite. They know they will get punished if, if they go gung-ho and just throw everything at other teams. They know teams are coming up against have got clever players who will exploit you. I just feel Celtic maybe haven't learned their lesson from you know last season in the Europa League. Last night was very much like, if you remember back to Betis and Bayer Leverkusen, I was watching the game thinking it's very much like that, that 
Celtic could go ahead and score three or four goals easily. But at the other end, you could easily see Leipzig doing the exact same. That's the way it was last season. Of course, you're stepping up and leveling the competition, which, you know, the dangers then, uh, you know, come around quicker uh, and you often get punished more. And you just wonder, you know, is he... Is he going to change? Well, he says he's not for changing, but to have success in this competition, I feel there's got to be a an address somewhere, you know, of balance that you've got to kind of give your defenders the best opportunity to keep a clean sheet. So, Mark, we, we I think we <clears throat> we all agree. Ange has obviously got a giant football brain, and uh, there's a strain of madness slash genius to him. So he he must. Maybe he's saying something publicly and thinking something differently. What what are what's his backroom staff saying to him when they're having this conversation? They know that what they did last night didn't work, and they know those other previous examples that you've you've given from last season. So, what are they actually thinking about long term success in this competition? Why why would they continue to do the same thing and expect different results? It's a very good question. Um, look, I, I played with John Kennedy, who's who's been there as Ange's right hand man from the start. John, of course, a very good defender in his time. Now, I've no doubt that the backroom staff have bought into what Ange Postecoglou has done because it's again, it's fantastic. You overwhelm teams, you play at a quick tempo, but at this level, like I keep saying, there, there's got to be a balance in, in how you do it. Um, so I've no doubt that, that John and Gavin Strachan, who you know, will analyse things and, and probably give them uh, their idea from a defensive point of view, how things could be more solid in terms of the middle of the pitch. I, I, I think that's where the problem is at this level. that The Celtic players vacate the middle of the pitch so often in, in, in trying to create chances and trying to get bodies into the box to overwhelm the opposition it does work because we've seen it against Real Madrid, we've seen it Shakhtar and, and now against Leipzig. It's just when you're left with that one holding midfielder and it's a big old pitch against athletic, quick players who quickly go past you and you're right onto a back four or a back two in some occasions because Celtic's fullbacks are so high. So look, they're clever guys, these guys on the backroom team. Ange Postacoglu is a very smart guy, knows football inside out. And, and last night in his post-match interviews, he's probably as disappointed as I've ever heard Ange uh, after a game, which maybe tells its story. I think he knows that at both ends it isn't going right because it, in these games you can, you know, you can maybe point to one area and say it didn't go well for us in that in that area of the pitch, and we need to work in that. But for Ange Postecoglou, it isn't just defending; it's the problem. It's in the penalty box; he's finding a problem. How often have we said that about Celtic domestically? Well, very little. Um, but he has to find a way in the Champions League he, of his players at the top end of the pitch, putting one of those chances away. I mean, there was 12, 12 attempts on goal last night from Celtic. Uh, an away team in the Champions League, that's good going. And they only take one of them. You put your defence under immense pressure to keep the ball at the net the other side. And you mentioned you mentioned the defensive absentees uh, there, Mark Cameron, uh, Carter Vickers being one of them, and uh, like Gordon Strachan after the match was kind of talking about you know systems don't win games, it's players that win games. Um, is that an issue as well that the, the defense just was a little bit leaky last night, just more leaky? Like, obviously, Leipzig and Celtic both good attacking teams, but Celtic's defense uh, let them down more than the Leipzig defense did. So. Do you know, is five at the back an option for Franz Postecoglou, or, or do you think he'll, he'll change his defensive structure in any way? No, no. He's, he's never going to go, in my opinion anyway, to five at the back. Um, <laughs> I could I could eat those words when it comes round to Leipzig next week, but I just can't see it. I mean, the amount of work he's put into the side with the, the back four and the inverted full-backs. You've seen it last night. I mean, it's how the second goal, I suppose, against them came about, that Greg Taylor goes into that inside pocket Joe Hart, I mean, Gordon Strachan, of course, is right. As players that won and lose your matches, Joe Hart doesn't need to play that pass to Greg Taylor. He could go to Jens and, and everything's, you know, ticking along fine. So I don't think he'll change. I, I do think the players that are missing for Celtic are, are big players. I mean, I think you can get away with missing some players or one or two here and there. But it's starting to affect the spine of the team when you look at 
Joe Hart making the mistake last night and looking at the weekend to go against Motherwell. I know Juranovic scores on goal, but I would blame Hart as much as anybody for that. Um, you take out Carter Vickers and Starfield, there's your first two centre choice centre halves. Cal McGregor has suffered an injury that Ange Postecoglou says it doesn't look good. Now that's a major concern. And in European competition, your front men through the middle aren't scoring. So this competition heavily re- relies on the, the spine of your team. And it's, uh, it's a bit shaky at the minute for Celtic. Is this all just part of the learning process <clears throat> for the players and the team and for Ange as well in that, like, you know, listen to you talk about this. It, it does sound like from a philosophical perspective, they are creating a lot of chances if they were to increase the performance level by 10 or 15 percent and a couple of those were to go in. Suddenly the game is really different. Like the psychology of the game is different. Leipzig are under the cosh at home, even though they they have a lot of the ball and they're attacking, but they've actually conceded two or three goals. It, it's a completely different um outcome or it's certainly a, a different outcome is on the cards um, and we're all talking about this and wow how brave Celtic were to go to Leipzig and, and stick to their principles um, is Ange thinking like if I have a slightly deeper squad next season and, and perhaps find a goalkeeper who's more reliable that the right thing to do is to stick with this and they'll look back on these as like okay that was the, the learning curve it was very steep and we got through it or is the other side like you change things and adapt and you 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 know, you drag Leipzig into a, a nil all and suddenly you're still in the group, but it doesn't feel as good because, you know, you're you're going away from your what your principles are and what you think you're working on week in, week out on the training pitch. Yeah, well, I, I don't think he's ever going to change his principles in that respect. I don't think he's ever going to go anywhere and try and play for a nil-nil draw. I think he's made that quite clear. As soon as he came in, Ange Postecoglou's first press conference, he said he was going to play football that got the fans off their seat, and he, he certainly done that. Um, and look, there, there was question marks going into this campaign in the Champions League, when especially when the group was drawn, if he was going to change those principles then. Well, he's shown he's, he's not going to. So, um, you mentioned about the goalkeeper. Look, Joe Hart is a reliable goalkeeper. I think he's been excellent since he's came to Celtic. He will make mistakes, um, but at this level, those mistakes get punished. I mean, if that's... If that's back home in the Premiership, would that would any player have the ability to play that pass first time and then the finish was very good? I don't know. But um, I think one thing's for sure is that, that, look, the players will get better at this level. Got to remember that this is our first campaign at this level. Um, some of them, you know, just getting used to Ange Postecoglou's style of play still. So they will get better. Um, if Celtic can qualify again for the Champions League next year, I do believe that there will be a better outfit. I mean, look, but we're, we're chatting like they're they're done and dusted. We've got two huge games coming up that they could uh, they could easily swing this group, and things look a whole lot different in the two home games coming up. Yeah, yeah, I can I can see why he would stick to his principles. Yeah, well, he's come this far, I guess, uh, and they're exciting games to watch. Like, I, I don't really want to lay blame. At anyone in particular, necessarily, Mark. But as a right back yourself, you probably have a, a good um, uh, scope on this. And, and Juranovic sometimes last night at right back, you, you almost feel like he's he's ball watching at times. Like is is that a concern? Has has he been has he been an issue over over the last number of games for Celtic? Is is, is it an issue going forward? Do you think, or is it just he had a bad game? I guess. I don't think so. Um, no, I, listen. I watched last night Juranovic going forward. I thought he was excellent. Funny enough, going forward, I thought the pace that he shows and, and the drive that he's got really takes Celtic up the pitch. Um, defensively, I know he scored an own goal at the weekend, but he also, you know, he also hit the, the crossbar with an outstanding free kick. Um, no, nah, listen, I can't see it with Juranovic. I think he's one of the more steady and reliable performers. Um, so I don't think they've got an issue in that respect. Sometimes think perhaps maybe he could get a hand for his wide guys, but Ange Postecoglou plays his, his wide guys so high and and far up the pitch, it's difficult. I mean, <laughs> I don't know how much I would have liked that as a fullback if, uh, say, Nakamura stood in the halfway line and allowed me to, to tackle, you know, Ronaldo or Ronaldinho or whoever else I was playing myself. I would I'd kind of be thinking, is there any chance you're coming back and help me? So he's got a tough old job. It's a tough gig, by the way, for the Celtic fullbacks. Greg Taylor on the other side you see him battling away he's reformed his Celtic career so 
But collectively, it's um, it's a disappointment for Celtic last night. There's no doubt about that. But um, I believe these two games coming up. Like, uh, if they play with that intensity at Celtic Park that they did in the first half against Real Madrid, I think they will take three points against Leipzig. And then it, it comes down to that game against Shakhtar um, two or three weeks later. It was interesting to listen to, to Joe Hart after the match as well, Mark, where he kind of... He fronted up, at least he came out in front of the, the media after his mistake during the game, but he, he referenced, you know, it was just a bad pass from him and he held his hands up on that and look, Leipzig were, were pressing with, with three men as well, which made it difficult for him to get that, that pass right, but he did say, you know, that's the way the manager wants us to play and, and you know, Ange wants Joe Hart to play out from the back. So, yeah, you know, it does lead to mistakes, but at the, but at the end of the day, you can't really blame Ange for an individual mistake. No, well, I, I listened to those comments as well. Joe was quick to say, you know, I'll front up, but it's, it's my fault. But that's the way the manager wants us to play. <laughs> I, I did have a wee chuckle at that because, I mean, if it's Cal McGregor trying to make that pass into Greg Taylor, I don't even know if he makes it because it's that tight. So, <clears> you know, it's an individual decision on the day. Joe, Joe obviously tried to thread the ball through it, the eye of a needle. I was never on got to give credit to Leipzig because when you see the way they front three press they understand that Celtic want to play that way like football's football's went a different way since I actually played it I can never imagine playing that way but these players are well drilled in it you know they're told that's the way to play they're, they're given the certain rotations and movements it's about execution on the night and mistakes happen and Joe unfortunately for Celtic made a mistake at a crucial time you know, especially after that goal was ruled out. And I thought Celtic were lucky in that respect. So it probably was just about steadying the ship at that time, you know, seeing it the next couple of minutes. And you probably expect someone would experience a Joe Hart um, not to make an error like that just at that time. You know, the cameras were still on the Celtic fans actually celebrating yeah. the goal being disallowed. And then, you know, as it, quick as you know it, they're, they're behind and the game's running away from them yeah yeah, <clears throat> definitely uh, he'd want that one back but it is all obviously then set up for uh, a magical European night under lights next week in Parkhead great to have you with us again Mark thanks a million for joining us cheers cheers guys thank you it's uh, Mark Wilson uh, former Celtic defender obviously you can hear him on Super Scoreboard on Radio Clyde as well now all this week we've got a fantastic opportunity to combine sports and leisure with a visit to LA on America's west coast you and two friends could be jetting off with multi-award winning Cassidy Travel on direct flights from Dublin with Aer Lingus on the 1st of December to spend four nights in the four-star hotel. It's called The Wayfarer. It's in downtown Los Angeles and you can take in the LA Rams against the Seattle Seahawks as it stands. All the teams in the NFC West have two wins each. Everybody's two and two. So uh, there's no doubt that this game will actually be meaningful in terms of the outcome for who's going to the playoffs. So to be with a hat for this great prize, just follow at Cassidy Travel on Twitter and retweet our competition post. It's all with thanks to Cassidy Travel, your one-stop sports travel shop. Sports and travel, a perfect match. You can visit CassidyTravel.ie for more. Take in the game, do some Christmas shopping in Los Angeles. It's not a bad trip. Um, The Celtic point, right? Like, I get the point you're making about make the change it's good enough for Jurgen Klopp. Mm. Klopp's in a mad crisis, though. Like, his team aren't performing at the same level, whereas, like, Celtic are still performing at the level in the league that they should be, and they're still evolving. So, if you start suddenly saying, well, actually, look, we really believe this, everything is game, is, is organised to do this one thing, and this is who we are, this is our identity, except this week, we're going to be somebody entirely different. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, and Mark's probably right, and to a, to a degree, I guess, of being devil's advocate in that, like, I probably don't think Anne should change should, should change style and, and the reality is like as discussed after the match last night like Celtic had so many chances last night for goals so they're, they're creating the chances um, and they still had positives I mean Jota was a positive Kyogo was a positive for them last night and we shouldn't forget that so it's not it, it is all to play for in the next couple of games and it is Leipzig at home it's then Shakhtar Donetsk at home if they can get even four points from those games they're looking a little bit better. Um, maybe the home atmosphere at Celtic Park can change things. And I, and I honestly, I don't think he would change style at home anyway. Now maybe you go to the Bernabeu in the last game needing something and, and if you want, you can kind of change things and, and narrow, it, narrow it down and, and, and break Real down if you can. But ah, I mean, at that stage, they'll already be qualified. Well, you have to yeah. hope that they're resting players. True. And then you just have to go and attack. 
yeah, yeah. And Real won again last night, which is which is good for the the rest of the teams in the group. At least then Real can run away with the group and fight it out for second place. The rest of them. So yeah. And just, he's probably not going to Also, change. do you want to feel alive or do you want to be like go and scratch your way to... Like, what's the point of that? Yeah. In, in the long term, like, Celtic weren't going to suddenly play Champions League football this season and be really good. Yeah, It just true. wasn't going to happen. And they're brilliant to watch. They're brilliant to watch at the minute. Uh, sorry, really successful. It wasn't going to automatically be, OK, we can now just coast our way through a group which has Real Madrid and Leverkusen in it. And, and they're more successful than, than Ra- like Rangers haven't scored a goal in the Champions League in 12 years. So, so that's important. So that, that, that's important. That's all well. that matters. Well, at least, you know, Celtic put up, um, Celtic, you know, Rangers were brilliant in the Europa League last year, but when it comes to the Champions League, Celtic can put, on, put, put in good performances in the group and, you know, if they can just get a win next week against Leipzig, yeah. it is all a blever. There's a good chance they will. It's 8.35 now. Spend the night in the company of hurling legends Anthony Daly, Eddie Brennan, Brendan Marr and Dan Shanahan as well as other sporting icons like Mickey Hart and Barry Garrity as Burge EA Club presents Reeling in the Hurling Years on Thursday the 13th of October so it's this day next week in the County Arms Hotel throw-in is at half past seven it's going to be emceed by Dara Maloney it promises to be a great night's entertainment as our star-studded panel go through their glittering careers and regale the audience with untold stories from the past there's also going to be a special edition of A Question of Sport on the night that can't be missed with all funds raised going towards the big redevelopment work in St. Brendan's Park. Limited tickets are €20 Euros each. They're on sale through Eventbrite or you can contact Michael Verney on Twitter for more information. It's at ML Verney. And to talk about the event and much more, I'm delighted to say we're joined on the line by Offaly legend Johnny Pilkington. Johnny, good morning to you. How are you? Morning, lads. Not too bad. I'm good for him, yeah. I'm sure um, uh, nights like uh, reeling in the hurling years, not bad crack, I'd say. Yeah. Listen, we're looking forward to it and... Uh, there's a lot of good characters there that are in it that uh, maybe Harlan might take the back seat and uh, the other tales that weren't let out in, in, in the 90s will come to the fore and uh, it should be a long and enjoyable night. Yeah, before we get to any of that, I do want to ask you about your own coaching career at the moment because you're involved with the underage setup in Offaly at uh, inter-county level, is that right? Yeah, listen, I was brought in as a, as a selector there with the Offaly Miners there this year. Um, Listen, it was a marvellous, successful year, so it was. Uh, prior to that, I'd been involved, I've done the club circuit and that, but like this year was a very special year for us. Um, very special bunch of lads. And, a lo- uh, you know, it's it, 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 there's a great uh, outlook for Offaly Ireland coming from these lads and, and other lads that are coming from through in the last two, two or three years. Did did this crew, did you know they were good? Like, had they had a good Tony Forrest or something? Did the whole county think, geez, there's something here? Well, uh, you know, I hadn't a clue about any of the lads when I was brought in. I was involved there last year with kind of the under-16, maybe in October or November, this time of the year. A friend of mine just asked me, listen, kind of come along. And then Leo asked me to come in. I hadn't a clue about them. They were talking about, listen, the last Tony Forrest till final to Tipperary, actually. Right. Uh, and, um, I, you know, I just dismissed that because under 14 doesn't make any difference to me at under 17 or or minor level but I would have to say we played Tipperary in a challenge match in probably February and this was the the moment that I just turned around and said and I said to the lads listen lads we're just we're in we're in this to win the All-Ireland you could see the enthusiasm the, the the work rate and you know, even on that night, it caught Tipperary off, uh, off or by surprise, it caught them off guard. And I think really from that night on, you know, things just kind of grew, and they got they just played their own game, and uh, they were marvelous from then on. Uh, obviously, they end up being having their hearts broken by tipping in the, the Ireland final in relatively controversial circumstances. Uh, I don't know if you make peace with that a defeat like that ever as a mentor, because like. For the rest of your life, there's always a what if and, and what have you. Like, I know that's incredibly difficult. Is there any part of your brain that's thinking, okay, we have to just use this now as fuel for the fire over the next couple of years to get as many of them through to the under 21 level and to get as many of them through to senior level? Yeah, no, the, the gas thing about it is that Dan Ravenhill, the captain, he asked me just straight after uh, the, uh, the final, he says, uh, did this ever happen to you? You know? And I had to think for a while, and I said, well, listen, we lost uh, an under-21 uh, All-Ireland final, and then, of course, we lost the big one, 95, as well. Um, so, you know, I have no problems with Tipperary getting the last-minute goal. There were things within our control. 
that we that we slipped up on there was things without our, uh, outside our control that we couldn't do anything about and it really just when it kind of comes down to everything mixture of everything uh it's just the name was on Tipperary's cup uh it was the cup was our uh, Tipperary's name is on the cup but saying all that i mean the, the big thing i get out of it is that these lads they had a phenomenal year in terms of you played in in, in an under 17 or a minor final in front of 27,000 people in Nolan Park against Tipperary. They played in Port Leash where, you know, the match was delayed. Again, the crowds were there. There was maybe 20,000 at that. That was unheard of. It's, it's unnatural. And these lads, on each and every occasion, they stood up and, and they played the game and, and, and they performed. So, you know, from here on in, listen, Park, we lost but we were part of a marvelous, um, uh, marvelous experience, which we were ourselves in, in 1989 when, when uh, Tipperary uh, won the under 21, another fabulous occasion. So, yeah, you know, just, you know, just love the, the fact that you were part of that. I know that Tipperary rivalry is fairly, fairly fresh down in your neck of the woods there as well, Johnny, no doubt. And um, like you, you referenced 89, like 87 was another one in minor level as well, where like when Jer talks about letting go of defeats like that, I know. Uh, wasn't it Connell Bonner, I think, who, one of your former UCD colleagues, probably wasn't able to let that defeat for Tipperary go for quite some time? Yeah, yeah, I've, I've told this story before. Like, I mean, after that match, I mean, th- that game could have gone either way. You know, we just happened to get a goal with about five or ten minutes to go, and that got us over the line. Uh, but I met Bonner there after the match, and he was, I didn't know him, and he was sitting beside him. And all through the senior match of the, of the All-Ireland, he was going on about... Oh, how did you beat us? How did you beat us? And I met him then in UCD a few years later. Oh, how did you beat us in this game? And then I met him on holidays five years ago. I, you know, I was saying, he says, still going on about the 87, you know? So, yeah, Connell had a problem with it all, right? But, uh, you know, it was, listen, great rivalry. We're talking here with uh, Johnny Pilkington, and the, the reason about this is because there's a, a night coming up. Uh, Michael Verney has organised. It's called Reeling in the Hurling Years. It's on, on Thursday, the 13th of October at the County Arms Hotel in Burr and you can get details of it uh, it's on Eventbrite or you can also get details on it from Michael Verney at ML Verney on Twitter Brenda Marr Barry Garrity Mickey Hart Sarah Farrell Michael Dignan Johnny Pilkington of course Dan Shanahan Eddie Brennan Anthony Daly and Brian Wheelahan with uh, as I said Darren Maloney on the night as well so um, it's going to be a decent night's entertainment and as I said all the money is going to the big redevelopment work in St. Brendan's Park Um. Johnny, I'm really interested in your decision to get back involved with the county. Like, was it easy enough? Where you said you'd done the the rounds in the club scene, is it is it kind of? Do you feel like it's time to get involved at county level? No, it's just an opportunity that that arose. I mean, I was uh, I would have to say that I'm kind of I was I'd done a ten or twelve years of coaching between different clubs, our own club, and I've been heavily involved with our underage here in 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 Bar as well. At under eights and tens, and basically it's my kids are involved, so you get involved with the team. And I was really kind of just fed up and and, and just kind of maybe burnt out from it. And I was intentionally going to kind of say, well, listen, I'm going to park that maybe for a while and see it. But Leo met me and uh, he asked me, you know, would I get involved with the with the miners? And I didn't really have any intentions, but it's amazing the way things work out. He he just said to me, listen, I'll give you a, a shout on on the Monday, uh, you know, this was a Friday or Saturday or something. And as it turned out, I think there was a bereavement on his side of things and he never came back to me for a week, you know. So what I said to Leo then, I said, listen, Leo, you know, it gave me a lot of time to think. And we looked at the fixtures there with Offaly and that and said, well, listen, the chances this could be over in March, April and, you know, definitely be over by the end of May. So it's only a six month thing. So, um, so that was my decision. He, he, he gave me that time to think about it. And I said, yeah, listen, we'll go for it. Now, I have to say that once I went in there, I mean, I, I don't really do an awful lot. So I don't, I kind of go in and talk to lads. And, you know, as a selector does, like Huey Annan is our hurling coach. He's doing all the work. Leo is doing all the work in behind the scenes and that. So, and we have our county board liaison officer in Martin Cashin. So to me, it was just kind of rocking up to, to training, having a look at training and then just saying, listen, this lad's going well or that lad's going well. But I have to say, I really enjoyed it. And I, again, it was easy. It was easy for us because this bunch of lads just kind of drove it on themselves. I mean, they set the standard and 
we'd have to give it them a you know we'd have to kind of give them a little bit of a slap every now and again just to kind of keep that effort up and that so uh that was really my role i suppose they did on occasions we did draw on uh, on my experiences and i suppose one of the remarkable ones was on the morning of the all ireland we we were leaving from the faithful fields and i said listen i'm going to bring them into the room in in the faithful fields and in the room you have the pictures of all the awfully uh, winning teams and I went through each and awfully winning team and I went through the 82 football and or the 81 hurling and the 82 football and, you know, the 94 team and the 86. I finished up, I think, with the 86 minor team or whatever. And on each occasion, you know, awfully had won by a last minute goal or had a big comeback, you know. So my inspirational speech actually backfired on me. <laughs> we were rocked by our own medicine, I suppose, was the, was the thing, so. I don't think they'll be asking me to do it again. <laughs> At least you tried, Johnny. At least you tried. We did. We did. We yeah. tried. We the tried. Uh, like, I remember, like even you speaking before the before that um, minor final last year, and I think like you were referencing the, I, can't, I guess the decreasing standard of of the club game in Offaly and how that's probably linked to the to the lack of success at inter county level. I think the word you used to describe Offaly inter county hurling over the last twenty years was was dismal. Like, what, what's your What's your feeling on, on where Offaly is at the moment? Um, you know, Johnny Kelly is, has, has a three-year stint. Um, and I've, I just have a feeling that it may be in three years' time, I don't think we will we'll be too much further on. Um, just for the just for the, the the thing that the work rate the enthusiasm and that over the last three and four years on the field that that tracking back that kind of simple stuff hasn't been there to the level that's required now i will you know i don't want to go on about the minors you know i was saying but this is what they brought to the game and it wasn't I, you know, we have had an awful lot of, of fabulous hurlers down through the years that are great ball players, but it's what players do off the ball and then what they do and where they're positioned. And that's that was the key. And that has been lacking in awfully that we've been great when we're on the ball, but we're not so good off it. So it's going to be tough for Johnny Kelly to try and bring in that kind of uh, closing down, that work rate to put pressure on the opposition and uh, to the to the level that it needs to be at. So I think, you know, what Johnny can do is maybe set a standard there for the next three years. And with these minors and these under 20s that are coming on, there's two or three that, um, that they, they'll inspire to kind of do more of the raw material on the field, more so than the, than the you know, the, the, the lovely strike, the lovely point, the lovely ball playing. So it's, it's, I think it's going to be a stagnant, maybe three years. Um, Obviously, Johnny will want to, uh, you know, we're looking to get out of the Joe McDonough. We're under no illusions here that we're capable of getting out of the Joe McDonough. How capable we are of sitting at the, the top table for a long period of time, is that's another question. Now, we do have confidence in these young lads, but as you know, young lads, you know, two or three of these could go and that could disperse the whole lot. Yeah, it, it really is a very tenuous thing. Like, you, you need another minor team and another minor team. And, you know, that's the way that the you can build on those foundations. I did want to, you, you mentioned the crowds at the game, right? A big controversy yeah. about um, on our Ireland final day, there's no minor crowd. And so everybody doesn't get in early. But I don't know. I don't know, would you trade a full house at Nolan Park for a tinny, empty Croke Park with the seagulls or the soundtrack to the All-Ireland minor final? Which would you prefer, having experienced both now? Uh, well, um, yeah, it's it's it's. Uh, I, I would have naturally have said, listen, give me Nolan Park there all day, you know. Uh, but the thing about it is that Offaly were in Nolan Park, and Offaly brought a huge crowd to Nolan Park, and Tipperary, uh, you know, um, came there as well. So it's you know. The minor final isn't going to be played in front of 27,000 every year. It's, you know, if you were the Cork, Kilkenny, Tipperary, Galway kind of game, there's probably going to be five or 6,000 at it. So in that, you know, you could turn around and say, listen, play it before um, an All-Ireland final. 
but from in terms of atmosphere, if you can get the crowds there, if you you know, it's I think it's 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 probably better better atmosphere in terms of even if you can get ten thousand into a Port Leash or in, into Nolan Park, it's a hell of a lot better than uh, you know the ten thousand on on uh, you know at the start in in, in Crow Park. Saying all that, All Ireland Final Day, the Senior Day, is a very very big day. And it that would heighten, you know, that gives you a, a, a greater sense that you're part of that whole day, and it's a it's a special feeling as well. Um, you know, the majority of people will actually come in, but you'll get that last twenty minutes there. And if the match is tight, which it had been in a few of our minor finals, you know, all of a sudden the crowd are are standing up and they're looking, and the neutrals maybe are cheering for the underdog. So it has its own kind of um, atmosphere there as well. Okay, so you, you're definitely on the fence there with that one. We're on the fence, yeah. yeah, yeah fair yeah, enough. Yeah. Maybe we need another few years to make our mind up entirely about it. Just the point you made as well about the the season being so short from a minor perspective, it does feel like it's maybe better for the kids at under 17 to be able to go back and have the rest of their school year and their summer off or to, to go back and play with the clubs as opposed to sticking all the way through to September and never quite getting the release that um, you know your team might have had uh, one last thing then the under 17 age grade, grade is it is that working or is that because there's definitely a lot of uh, chatter that maybe the under 17 is, is, isn't really the right age and that actually under 18 we should go back to that what's your view on that? Um, again, I think it, it, there's too much talk well not too much talk but obviously the talk is there I don't see an awful difference Um uh in whether you go to 17 or 18 my understanding was we went to the 18 uh, or came down to the 17 to avoid uh kind of the leave insert which you know is 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 a fairly good idea um whether it goes up to 18 or not i i i don't see it making that much of a difference really um the different age groups and that uh, there is obviously, you know, once you go on to 18, you're a year ahead, you're here in terms of development and that. I don't think it makes an awful lot of difference, really, because, you know, at 17 or 18 or 18 coming up in, into the senior ranks. And I think this is the issue more probably than than the minor grade being 17 or 18 is that is the 17 year old playing under 20 and uh, there's a three year difference there or whatever. But and different stages of life. So maybe, maybe that's an issue in terms of, listen, let's get them a little bit more bigger, uh, that, you know, in terms of naturally bigger and as well as the, the, the strength and conditioning to be able for, for that level. But to be honest with you, I didn't see anything this year in terms of a 17 year old age group versus our minor time in, in, in our time. Okay. Can I just ask you, Johnny, um, <clears throat> I think you like, I was thinking back to different Lake Regale episodes when, when, when uh, a few months ago when Desi Farrell announced that, that uh, you know, Mannion and McCaffrey were coming back into the, the Dublin setup and, and he so nonchalantly kind of dropped it into a, to an interview and that look, that's his prerogative. I'm not saying Desi doesn't have a personality. I'm just saying that that's, I guess, the way that things have been done in Dublin the last few years. It, it struck me, there was, there was a line, um, and I think it was around your own Lake Regale episode where, where Michael Moynihan in, in the Irish Examiner um, talked about yourself and personalities in the GEA and he said you were the last free spirit before the erosion of personality. Like, do you think personalities are, are something missing from the game at the moment? Like, we see a lot of Sherlockets in, in interviews and, and, and we're kind of missing that little bit of a spark that maybe we used to have and you certainly brought to the table back in the day. Yeah, well, that kind of spark is probably what you refer back to now as immaturity, in it, so it, it was. But I suppose, yeah, managers now, they have a, a range on, on the thing and it's a pity um, there's definitely, you know, I mean, I, you, there's definitely characters within the game that we don't seem to be, um, they don't seem to be getting out of it. And, you know, we know those characters are there, you know, I mean, I suppose the Kilkenny team of, of, of the 2000s and a marvellous team, and it was, but it was all the same mantra, you know, they were, they were afraid, you know, that if they didn't go train and listen, they wouldn't get into team and all that. Um, and you know that's that's grand coming from someone on the fringes, but when your top players are saying it, you know they just seem to be towing the line or that, you know, and and it's continued on that way. I think managers are trying to, you know, cross all their T's and dot all their I's and make sure there's nothing said. So it's bit, I don't know how you're going to get around it. Um, you know, I suppose the other side of that is the way. Um, 
fitness has gone as well that it's a funny one you know that we have professional rugby players professional soccer players that have a social life in this world and it's obviously our ga players can't do anything for six months or you know and uh, that's that's it's it's a bit off-putting but um I, you know that's the way the game has gone and unfortunately for the media and that uh you'll find there that you're going to have to wait for their careers to be over before you'll see their true uh, characters and that. Just a final one for me, Johnny. You, you talked about taking the, the young lads in to, to look at some of the photos of, of the old Offaly teams. Mm. Like another <clears throat> fellow county man who's, who's done great things and I know you're a bit of a bit of a golfer, I think I'm right in saying, yourself yeah. uh, at the minute. So Shane Lowry is someone who, who really, we shouldn't be surprised at what he's been doing over the last number of years because he continues to do it. But uh, again, another man who's, who's, who's put your county on the map and, and probably inspired a lot of those young lads as well. Yeah, listen, Shane has been marvellous um, and again, steeped in the tradition of Offaly, um, Offaly GA with all the Lowry's and that. He's never been shy on the international stage, you know, to show that uh, Offaly jersey and that. And, you know, the rumour had it that, um, and well, I don't think it was a rumour, but on All-Ireland final day, he was putting on the Offaly jersey to go down the 17th or the 18th driveway uh, or 18th uh, fairway on um whatever tournament he was playing, I didn't, you know, I don't know what it was. And uh, we were two pints up at the time. And I think he got to the 18th tee box and uh, the caddy just gave him a, a quick nod and all, last minute goal. So he put the jersey back in the bag. But uh, he's been marvellous in terms of, listen, he's after coming on board. And, you know, he, I don't know what his talkings were with JP McManus in terms of how JP has invested money in Limerick. But his money is, you know, is 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 going to be a major help kind of coming through. Plus, he'll have the experience of a management team there. Now, you know, the gas thing about our um, Shane uh, has been do, doing all that. But that's part of, say, the Faithful Fields project that's over there. And that has been a massive, massive success. I think it just brings a major spirit to, you see, you have the minors going in there and they're training with the under 20s, the C. Doffley senior footballers, C. Doffley senior hurlers, the C. the whole professional outfit on it. So, you know, Everything, everything is combining, you know, with 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 year long work in terms of fundraising and, and getting facilities right. That is all a major help. And maybe I'm, I'm just saying, maybe, maybe these are little the green shoots that can bring Offaly back up to that next level. Yeah, no doubt. Up. Johnny, great stuff. Great to have you on. Thanks a million for talking to us. Have a great night. Cheers. No problem. Thanks a million, lads. That's Johnny Pilton, who's part of that fundraiser uh, this day next week. And as I said, at ML Verney on Twitter for tickets for us. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us this morning, 0879-180-180 is the WhatsApp number. Now, uh, a reminder, OTBAM brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. We're joined on the line now, I'm delighted to say, by Alan Mangan, who's the Castletown Gagan Senior Hurling Manager, whose side have just won the Westmead Senior Hurling Championship for the first time in five years. Alan, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning, lads. Yeah, not too bad now. Wasn't good this week. It'd never be good. I was going to say, uh, congratulations first off. Um, People will be familiar with you as a footballer, uh, a yeah. Leinster winner with Westmead. How did you end up as the manager of a hurling team? Well, to be honest, I actually played county hurling before I played county football. So it would have been, we would be a very strong hurling uh, area in Westmead. Not so much for the football. I think the only person really before me would have represented Westmead in football would have been Willie Lowry and Paddy Corker. And apart from that, nobody really else played football for Westmead. So we'd be very strong. Uh, area in terms of hurling so I would have played an awful lot of hurling growing up and never really played football with Westmead until I was in me under 21 never right. played minor or anything like that so I played hurling the whole way up and then just fell into football then later on My favourite uh, cliche that the hurlers have is anybody can play football who can play hurling <laughs> any hurler can always play football so you're maybe you're just proof of it took it up at 21 kicked four points in a Leinster final replay to win the game thanks very much no big deal Oh, Jesus. I don't know if you saw the first, if you watched the first day, you would know that I wasn't <laughs> that good at all. Uh, very quickly, I was carted off after 45, 50 minutes the first day, so I got lucky the second day. It's good to make amends, and good to make amends to this, I think, yeah. as a manager, this is your third county final in the last three or four years, is that right? Um, well, no, it's uh, in 2016 and 17, or 15 and 16, I managed uh, turns past senior footballers in a county final. Um, so unfortunately, we came up against this strong St. Lomas team that are still at at the minute. 
and we got be- be- beaten by three, four points the first day and two points the second day. So um, it was third time lucky for me in terms of senior county finals, I suppose. Yeah, well, no harm. So um, you're, you're obviously, you, you see parallels between managing football teams and, and managing hurling teams as well. Is it just is it just about having a clear identity and everybody knowing what their, their job is and making sure that you get buy-in on that? Or are there more specific nuances to it? No, really. I, to be honest, I, I sort of trained the senior hurling team this year with, like, I had a great management team along with me. Um, but we trained them sort of like you train the football team. It's... Uh, Lots of short-sighted games, lots of uh, condition games, stuff like that. So we didn't. I didn't really change it up too much. We were trying to change football drills into hurling drills and vice versa for Australian football. So um, no, it, it's all about having the right group of lads behind you. And if they're willing to buy into whatever you're saying, you could get the results at the end of the day, which we did. It's funny, Alan, when you when you're like a, thinking of Mayo and, and teams losing finals, and from Castletown's perspective, they've they've been the bridesmaids quite often in 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 finals. Like looking back to the last couple of years, lost by a goal in 2019, goal after extra time 2020, and then by uh, three points to a Harney last year. As you say, you've mm-hmm. come on board this year, but uh, Clonkill, the, the team you beat in the final at the weekend, like bit of a bogey team. I know you played them in the first round of the championship this year and, and lost by by ten points. So. Quite the turnaround yeah. to go from a ten point defeat to winning the, the county title against them. Well, to be yeah, true. But like the way the season was condensed for us this year, we ended up playing um, Sunday and Wednesday before we played Clonkill on the Saturday mm. in the first round of the championship. So we had two football matches within six days of that first round at senior, and we got a couple of injuries. Um, and then unfortunately Angus Clark in the first game halfway through the game tore his hamstring, and he'd be one of our more prolific players, let's say. And uh, we sort of we we got a bit of a trim in that evening. There's no doubt, and uh, we sort of started off really bad, but we got it going as the year went on. And unfortunately, the footballers got knocked out in the group stages of the championship, and that sort of helped us get a bit of rest into the lads and sort of get we could concentrate on more training, you know. To another degree, then I guess you had the advantage of having a semi final, whereas <clears throat> Clonkill were were going that well that they they were straight to it through to a final against yourself. So. I know you've referenced work rate and stuff in interviews before. Like, did the, having that semi final give give yourselves an advantage almost heading into the the decider? Well, it probably did because Clonkill, unfortunately for them, had qualified for the for the county final nearly uh, six weeks in advance right. of the final. Like their last game was a dead rubber. I think they played Lachlan Gales and Lachlan Gales were already out. But like we qualified, we qualified last year through the same route. We played a semi final against Clonkill, and then we beat Clonkill, and we lost the final. So people can say one or the other, but Clonkill sort of had a long layoff where they didn't have really too many competitive games, whereas we had quarter final more or less, albeit but name against Pollard, and then we had um, Raharney in the semi final. So we had a good run into it, but we got better as the, we got better as the year went on. We started off poorly and. Slowly but surely got got it going and thankfully got across the line. Long time waiting and the management team over the last few years were excellent and just unfortunately they didn't, they didn't get across the line but we we luckily enough did. Can I ask you just how, how many senior hurling clubs there are in Westmead at the moment? Uh, there's six in Westmead at the minute. Right. Um, and what happens is you play everybody top team goes through to the county final and second and third play a semi-final. Okay, that makes sense. Um, with With six teams it's like obviously not a massive pick of senior hurlers and I'm sure there are some um, intermediate and junior hurlers who the uh, senior intercounty management team are looking at but like it feels from the outside that there's been something slowly steadily building in Westmead hurling over maybe the last 10 years really but the results in the summer were maybe the best ever at a, at a level that was sustained yes. maybe it's not the best ever but certainly in the last 20 years there was like a proper sense of these games being competitive the result against Wexford was sensational yeah. like it, yeah. do you feel that do you feel a part of that at the moment absolutely I was like I was selected with Westmead last year when we won the Joe McDonough with uh, Shane O'Brien Noel Ark and Paddy O'Neill um, I was selected with the lads last year and there was a great bunch of lads there like there's like like anywhere else we have we have clubs coming in from intermediate and senior B that are producing players that are good enough to play with the county. Unfortunately, the, the other structures within some of the clubs is probably needs to be improved. But in terms of a county panel, there there's some great hurlers in Westmead. There's fantastic players. Um, like we have like we've Killian nominated for an all Killian Doyle nominated for an All Star this year. And 
very surprised that Tommy Doyle wasn't nominated for him to be fair at full back he, he's been excellent all year as well I've been at nearly all their matches so uh, no, there's great structure in Westmead in terms of uh, the county set ups and the way they're, they're, the county board are working on improving players and stuff like that so with a bit of luck they might get another really good run at this year and if they can hold their own for another year you never know what might produce itself in a couple of years and is there stuff? Is there enough coming through at underage as well to suggest that this isn't just one group of players who've come through? That actually there's the beginning of a production line. Yeah, absolutely. Like with the under twenties this year, like with with five or ten minutes to go against Wexford in the under twenty championship, um, there was only three or four points in it, and they were well in it, and we lay in a soft goal, and and uh, then. Wexford sort of kicked on and won by seven or eight in the end. But there's a right good bunch of players coming through. Like, I think this year, well, I don't think there was any under-20s um, played championship this year for Westmead. So you have that group of players coming through to challenge Wexford all the way in that under twenty. So if we can get three or four of them to pull through, and we have two young lads playing with us this year that were only under-17 last year, and David O'Reilly scored four points from play the other day, and Peter Clark scored two. So there are two great um, prospects for the future just coming from our club along with two or three other lads as well. We're, we're probably all guilty um, at the minute, Alan, of, uh, in the media of, of not giving enough focus to the, to the club game and it's probably taken more of a, a front seat, I guess, over the last couple of months given the, the way the calendar has been, has been laid out. Like, you see so many stories, like I know Niall O'Brien was your, was your captain of the weekend who got to lift the trophy and he probably couldn't be captain the last couple of years because his dad was the manager and maybe didn't want to yeah. pick him as, as the captain. Like, someone who's probably served Castletown for for many years finally getting the moment and, and I can only imagine what it means for the people of Castletown as well to celebrate a win like that so you almost forget these stories in the grand scheme of the inter-county game but, it, but it's brilliant to see moments like that people, the people of Castletown getting to celebrate and Niall O'Brien getting to lift, lift the trophy Absolutely like everyone that knows Pat like Pat was a big reason for us uh, lifting the trophy this year like he trained most of these lads since they were under 12 the whole way up and unfortunately he was there the last three years and they didn't get across the line but we, did, we didn't have to do too much with these lads they were, um, they were well drilled well trained by Pat before we even came along so the, the good thing for Niall was that Pat wasn't there that he got to captain the team because Pat would never pick him as the captain unfortunately so he uh, sure Niall has been one of the best players in, in Westmead over the last 10 years and uh, it's great to see him going up the steps to lift the cup but in terms of um, teams the, the way the, the club has been looked at at the minute I think it's great that um, we're getting a bit of focus on the club scene now like if we didn't play if we didn't play, if we went back to the normal route of things that the all Ireland final would have been only played a couple of weeks ago and we'd still be focusing on the all Ireland football final rather than focusing on some of these county finals Do you take any elements of, of other managers that you've played under yourself in, in into your own management like the, like even modicums of, of Paddy O'Shea's style and management from, from those glory days at Westmeath like do, do you do you recall moments and things and team talk styles and that sort of that sort of stuff into your own managerial style or how do you how do you approach it? Oh absolutely yeah no I think um, especially uh, Paddy and Tomas O'Flaherty and Michael Ryan would be three lads that I would really um, have focused on and what they were doing over the over the last couple of years in terms of me being manager, um, I would have wrote down a lot of things that we would have done at training and some of the stuff the lads would have said and tried to use them and pretend that they're me on and they're not me on at all. But uh, the the lads, um, the, them lads were unbelievable. Sure, they were three of the best managers that anybody could ever work under. Um, I think in terms of speeches, I, I couldn't really use some of the stuff. Sure, didn't party give me a, a charge one day for being thrown out over the line like a loaf of bread. So oh, I that was you. That was me. All oh, right, yeah. Jesus, you're famous. <laughs> that was me for being thrown like over the line like bread. a loaf of bread. So, pardon? Like a loaf of bread. That's an amazing yeah. speech, right? Yeah. So he, uh, I was the one that was on the front end of that. It was about two stone lighter than I am now, so people mightn't recognise me that much. <laughs> but I still hear it. I still hear it to this day. When you, when you, if you go away for a weekend, someone will surely spot you along the line. Right. Uh, what was that like, actually, when you were <laughs> when Paulie's ball at you? Because you know it, the the it comes out the the, the program maroon comes out after you've won something, but you're living in the middle of it, going, "Jesus, am I going to get dropped here? Like, is is this what? is this tough love from Paulie? Because he trusts me, he, he knows I'm going to take it right, or is it like what? shit? What's going to happen?" Yeah, no. In fairness, now Paulie would always have said, "If I don't rate you, I won't give out to you." Right. So. 
I came off, to be honest, I was taken off, as I said earlier, I was taken off after about 50 minutes of the first day. And I was very poor, extremely poor. And I went away and was thinking, Jesus, am I going to even start the next day? What's going to go on? But when he actually gave me the charge at uh, a training in front of everyone and gave Derek even, luckily enough, he came in after Derek, after me, giving him a, giving him a charge and not being tight enough. So I sort of got slightly away with it. It wasn't on my own. But I sort of knew he w- that I was going to start the following weekend then because he wouldn't have said anything to me at all if if he wasn't going to start me. So I sort of had relaxed and trained well that week. And uh, But it was a little bit of a kick in the arse, probably the kick in the arse that I needed, to be honest. So um, some things are said for a reason, and lucky enough, I got away with that one. Because, like all joking aside, you did play really, really well in the in the replay. Yeah, no, I played well in the replay. played really well. I actually played really well all year, to be fair, leading up to it. And then, I don't know, maybe it was nerves got the better of me, but it was, uh, and it was also Mark and Joe Higgins and, Probably the best player, apart from Sean Marty Lockhart, probably the best player that I that I ever had marked. Um, no, we're still, yeah, we just lost the, the Skype connection there. It's unfortunate. Didn't I've totally forgotten that he was the, the loaf of bread guy. That's a uh, yeah. It's it's one of those things you they forget in the annals of of history as as time moves on. But I can only imagine the speeches Paddy O'Shea gave in those dressing rooms, like. Just if you can, if you can't get pumped up for a match listening to Paddy O'Shea, then I don't think I'd say you we saw the best of them in the documentary. Yeah. To be honest, yeah, yeah. At least we got the insight. Yeah, um, um, only for the cameras, you'd be you'd be in trouble because you'd be trying to imagine what what it was like in those dressing rooms. But Alan, that, Alan's back there now. Yeah, Alan, you were just saying uh, Keith Higgins the first day, I think, or not Keith Higgins, um, Joe Joe Higgins was it? You're marking the first day. Yeah, it was Martin Joy Higgins the first day, and he absolutely cleaned me out. There's no doubt, like he. And then I had the, I had the audacity to think I was going to take Darren Rooney on down the line uh, with a ball, and Darren left me in nearly in the front row of the stand. So that's where the loaf of bread came out of. He drove me over the line. So, uh, but listen, apart from Joey, apart from Joe Higgins, Sean Marty Lockhart, they're two of the best players I ever marked. So I was. I was lucky enough I didn't have to mark Joe the second day. Dennis Glennon was that good the first day. Joe had to go over and pick him up. Yeah, you, you probably had to mark John Keane quite a few times in training, I'd, I'd imagine, as well. And like himself and Desi now in in the Westmead, Westmead senior football job. Like, was that, were there two lads who you, in hindsight, looked back and said, yeah, they were two leaders in the dressing room and, and probably inevitably were going to go on and, and manage Westmead at some point? Yeah, absolutely. Like, um, probably. Arguably, two two of the best players that ever played for Westmead, if not the two best players, um, and it's great to see them involved. Like it was, it was a massive boost for Westmead last year to get Desi and John involved. The one year, it's uh, it's not too often that you can get two all stars to slip into a a setup the way that Jack got them involved. But uh, listen, Jack did a great job with them over the last few years. They're they're on the up, they're improving every year, and uh, with a small bit of luck, Des and uh, Des and John can bring them on to another level again. It's it's a great appointment. I know from talking to, I'd be very friendly with David Lynch. Obviously, he's from my club, and uh, a few of the other lads. I'd be still friendly with lads, uh, Kieran Martin and likes them, and it, they, they're really excited about the two lads being involved. And it's great for Westmead at the air. It's funny because um, Michael Dignan's involvement with Offaly, we all kind of pay a lot of attention to what's going on. But what's happened in Westmead GA in recent years, uh, as a dual county, is at least keeping pace with what's going on in Offaly, if not outstripping it. Like, obviously, um, the footballers had an incredible year. And I think they kind of actually made the Talton Cup by the celebrations, in a way. Like, the outpouring of emotion that they won a trophy, that that team, and particularly some of those players who are all-time greats, mm-hmm. that, like, they enjoyed that so much and took so much from it. It now, it gives the whole competition this huge boost in terms of profile next year. So I like you know you guys are the um, club hurling champions. Like not that there's expectations, but there's an opportunity for you to go on and and I don't know maybe do something for the rest of the year as well. Yeah, well, listen, just in terms of the Italian Cup, it's great. It's it's a it's a massive competition. It's it's absolutely brilliant that that we have that competition to play for, and the lads are going to go on a holiday and enjoy it, and rightly so. Um, the way the Westmead celebrated it was a, it was brilliant. Like we were in Mullingar and I remember standing on the sideline or standing on the side of the street looking at it, thinking like there was there was memories of two thousand and four coming back to how mad it was. Like it was absolutely crazy. And then you have the Joe McDonough from last year as well. It wasn't quite such big scenes, but it was close enough. It was similar enough in in regards to that. And then with us, um, 
we have to play the Kilkenny champions down in Nolan Park now and like we're going to go back training this Sunday morning we'll give the boys the week to enjoy the week we'll go back training Sunday morning and listen there's not no one's going to expect us to go down there and win but we really want to go down and give a good account of ourselves just to prove that Westmead Hurland is in a good place not alone just the county team but the club scene's in a good place as well and we're hoping that we can we can give a good account of ourselves down there in five weeks time and if we you, you never know if, if Lady Luck shines down this you never know what may happen Well listen Alan if you do get any Lady Luck it'll be well deserved thanks a million for joining us this morning you've been great cheers Please. Appreciate it, lads. Thank you. It's uh, Alan Mangan there, obviously celebrating uh, success with the uh, with the club in Westmead, and we'll obviously keep a close eye on that um, uh, provincial championship as it starts. Yeah, he's a, he's a, he's an interesting guy, and, and like those, those scenes in Westmead, really, I think you're right. Rubber stamp the the Talton Cup as something that we should be watching, and the teams will want to win. Like Cavan will have been gutted, and it will only have been, I guess, added to the devastation at losing that game because of the way in which they had to probably watch and see Westmead celebrating on the news and stuff um, adds, a, adds an element of of because you're thinking right this is a new trophy it's got no history it's got no uh, folklore behind it but um, now it does and that's that's all with thanks to Westmead so uh, yeah brought, definitely brought back some memories of the, the 04 glory days It's at quarter past nine this morning Graham Shaw says Celtic are good yes but some of the pressing is just crazy running out of good positions to run after the ball with no hope of getting it sometimes it's just not on like the other thing is they look exo- like they looked quite tired some of the players after half an hour I thought a little bit leggy and that that's obviously down to the style of play but um, uh, Ange Postecoglou do as you say he's not going to change so they're probably one of the fittest teams in, in world football at the minute because of the way they play you know if they were to get out of their group next year they'll point at yeah. the learning curve this year and I, I know uh, Joe Hart has uh, not made mistakes in, or that often in the league but like maybe you need to move on from him and find somebody who isn't going to make that decision. Isn't going to play that ball. Doesn't have that brain fart in his game. Yeah. Um. I, you know, the Celtic fans obviously very proud of, of what he's done since he's got there because he's been a, an important part of their success. But anyway, uh, Powell seventy four says Westmead and Offaly leading the fight back in Leinster are the bigger counties. Me than Kildare going to step up. Well, um, they've all got their own version of the magnificent seven going as well. So it'll be interesting to see what Colin Moore can do. Um, Johnny McGee was a tough man it's nice to hear this says Michael yeah that interview uh, really sensational stuff um, Johnny speaking with his daughter uh, Joyce wanted to win the All-Ireland playing attacking football and now he has Galway the most defensive team assembled in the country says MJW bit harsh bit harsh have you seen some of the Ulster football yeah MJW have you and I mean, they're, they're a little bit more def- did you watch Derry at all <laughs> they're a little bit more defensive and I enjoyed watching Galway last year against Armagh and against Derry uh, I thought they I thought they were good games and not necessarily ultra defensive. So, yeah, no, and whatever gets you the win. Look, it's it's like Ange, Porrick Joyce is going to do what he can do to get them as far as he can. So, fair play to Porrick. Uh, poor Kathleen left off air and a salmon t shirt makes it on, says MJW in tennis tanks. Says, I thought Shane didn't have a shirt on. It took me a while. Going to get, <clears> a, lot <throat> of, get a lot of stick for this one. There you go. You should just not wear the um, the shirt over it next week and see what people Yeah, just wear, I'll, I'll just cover up for all the people offended in the comments. Sorry, yeah. sorry, folks. <clears throat> Uh, right, uh, we are going to be back after these with Israel Olatunde, Ireland's new superstar sprinter. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. The Koi Gig Pod on OTB Sports. I need to do that more. Every time I say something about an Irish player, they just go and they, they kick my ass the next time and they're absolutely brilliant. So <laughs> I'm going to ask you to start slating me every Friday just so that I play a bit better on a Saturday. <laughs> Felt like a classic Arsenal win. I think they should be winning the league realistically. Keep up to date with all the WSL action every Tuesday and subscribe to the feed in the OTB Sports app now. OTB AM with Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. All right, well, Israel Olatunde, Spar European Athletics Championship finalist, was this week at the launch of the Spar College Fund, in which third level students in Ireland have the chance to win two prizes of €5,000 each to support them this academic year. Spar has teamed up with the fastest Irish man in history, Israel, and TikTok star Kian Mooney, and are calling on college students across Ireland to record a TikTok video in their local spar in under 10.17 seconds and share it to Kian Mooney's TikTok channel to be in, in with a chance of winning. To find out more, you can, of course, visit www.spar.ie. Delighted to say Ireland's fastest man in history, Israel Olatunde, is with me on the line. Israel, how are things? Yeah, not too much, Ian. Thanks, Thanks for having me. I'm sure you don't get uh, sick of being 
called Ireland's fastest man in history. It's it's a pretty cool title to have, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's pretty it's pretty cool. It's a bit, it's a bit strange at the same time, you know, to think that uh, <laughs> I can actually call myself that. But yeah, it's like this is it's stuff of dreams, really. Like you kind of dream of moments like this when you're young and you're coming up in the sport. You know, it's always like a goal of mine. And to actually just see it, you know, come to fruition really means a lot to me. And I'm really grateful for all the support I've had and we're leading up to this point. Were you kind of blown away by the by the reaction after the the race in Munich, and especially that when you broke the Irish record of Paul Hessian? I mean, it must have been quite extraordinary. I think you said yourself that you know you went viral after that, and 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 became a bit of a household name here in Ireland as well. So it must have uh, taken some time to get used to all to all of that. Um, yeah, I was pretty, I was pretty surprised to be honest. Um, just seeing the reaction of every, everybody. I think I remember after the race, like I didn't have my phone, so I didn't really know what was going on. Um, I remember the first time I called was my mom. And then I remember checking my social media and just seeing uh, everything kind of go a bit crazy. But I mean, it's, it really is like an honor to you know, just just to get that type of reaction and to make you know to put a smile on so many people's faces. Like that really means. I think that's really what made the moment so special. And um, to share that moment with my family, my coach, um, and just everyone that's helped me get to this point, but also with the country as well. Um, it really is a great feeling. And um, you know, Paul Hassan as well. I remember he reached out to me over Twitter and just sent me a really a lovely message. So he's a great, he's a, he's a, he's a class actor, great guy. So I'm really um, honoured to kind of, you know, to carry on the mantle really, um, of Irish Ireland's fastest one. You, you, you mentioned your mum there and I know uh, she's been a, a big influence on your career as well and, and both of your parents, in fact. But uh, I've heard you talking about the fact that your, your dad claims he, you got your speed from him, but uh, I know your mum was a sprinter back in the day. So, so is, it, uh, is it an argument in the house as to where you got the speed from? I mean, it's not really an argument, but just if my if I'm not there and if my mom's not there, my dad's gonna take credit. So but if I'm there, I'll I'll set the record straight and tell him that <laughs> it wasn't from him. Um, but now my mom, she used to run when she was uh, younger, so um, she was shopping for a school and for a state as well. Um, and my sister was actually the one that kind of got me into athletics. She used to do athletics with the, her school, with secondary from secondary school, and uh, my mom used to take me along just to kind of watch them, and um, just from there, I kind of got interested in. In in it, and I guess the rest is just history. Really, how how important has the support been from from Dundalk? I know uh, everyone from the town is, is is very supportive of you, and and it's kind of um, put the town on the map in in more ways than one because it's 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 obviously a big sporting area as well. The soccer team and 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 uh, the Louth Gaelic football team and, and all other sports kind of uh, takes out a stage in Dundalk. But uh, I'm sure that was nice to to kind of go go back home and kind of relax after the the, the atmosphere in Munich and and just. And soak in the atmosphere back in the dock. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a proud Dundalkian, so it really means a lot to me to be able to, you know, obviously like we're famous for our football, but to you know shed a, a light in a different way, you know, in, in athletics, you know, obviously just Kate O'Connor as well, who's been doing amazing things, and you know, to be able to share kind of the stage with you know athletes like her as well, it really means a lot to me. And just do the do my turn, do the turn proud. Um, I got I was getting those messages on Twitter and stuff like that, but from Dundalk, um from the lot of people just like just give me so much support and everything that really meant a lot to me for sure you, you mentioned Paul Hessian there and, and that's a record the uh, 100 meters record nationally that that has stood for for quite some time um and like even listening to Paul talking after after you broke the record he was delighted that it was you that did it um but he was also really interesting um kind of listening to Paul talking about the 100 meters itself and he, he was talking about how the mental side in the, in the 100 meters in particular is is nearly ninety percent in the head was the quote he he um, came out with. Would you would you agree with that? That it's kind of a discipline that that really you have to be obviously physically strong, but but clearly mentally it's uh, it's very important to be uh, at the top of your game as well. Yeah, hundred percent. I think you know in every any sport you know the mental side is so important. Is but I think especially in the hundred meters when the margin is so fine that like one you know misstep can you know, cost you. Uh, it costs your race really so i think it's so important to be in the right mental state to get to produce your best and to to do what you need to do really so that's something that yeah, i'm still young but it's something i've been working on um over the last year i guess specifically with my coach dan Kogal, and something that we've kind of seen great improvements on but still some improvements to be made um but just even at the european championships there like um i was really proud of the way i kind of conducted myself you know in each after each round um it is toxic mentally but um it's just it's just part of the game really and you have to kind of learn how to deal with that um deal with the stress and with the pressure and to channel it into a positive way it's able to kind of help you i guess in your performance do you kind of take take influence and, and inspiration from from other sports people i know just before we came on air we were 
talking about the, the Muhammad Ali poster behind me here. And I know you said you had, you had an Ali poster in, in your own bedroom. Like, are there sports people like that, whether they're past or present, that you kind of have taken inspiration from growing up? Yeah, 100%. I think at the moment, like Muhammad Ali probably is a, a person that you know, I'm kind of, I can look up to. And I'm reading his one of his biographies at the moment, just learning about him as an athlete and as a person. Um, he's a very interesting character for sure. So I think there definitely is things to learn from him, from the way he conducted himself for sure. Um, but in terms of sprinting, uh, there's a sprinter called Noel Lyles that you know, I kind of admire how he kind of runs his race. And that's something I'm trying to you know, emulate. You know, he's so strong over the last 15 years. And that's something I'm trying to, I've, I've improved on, but I think there is definitely improvements to be made. So I'm trying to kind of copy what some of the stuff he's kind of doing. It's funny when you mentioned the, like the Ali biography, like there was one I read a, f- a few years ago myself, Jonathan Ig, I think wrote, wrote that's, that's, that's the one, one is it? Yeah, yeah. It, it, but it must be, it must be fascinating from your perspective to read that book because, you know, although Ali was in a different sport, he he was also an individual athlete like yourself, where I know you get to take part in the, the in the relay, which is, you know, I guess a team discipline, but, but by and large, you're training by yourself, you're competing by yourself. So from that perspective, I guess you can see similarities in, you know, the, the life of a boxer and the life of an athlete it's quite similar in some ways um yeah i guess so but i mean i wouldn't really it's i i, I wouldn't really describe athletics as like an individual sport you know um i guess you compete on your own and that's i guess competing is like the easy part because the hard part is you know the training and everything kind of leading up to the race but you know in that process you know, I have so much support from just my coach from my training partners uh, my family, just like I have a really good support system that, you know, helped me every step of the way. So it's hard to, you know, to take all the credit for um, any given performance when so many people have, you know, had a hand in what I'm kind of achieving today. How, how important is the, is, is the, the coach-athlete uh, dynamic? I know Daniel Kilgallen has been working with you for, for a few years and he's someone that's been very important to your to your progression over the last few years as well. And uh, am I right in saying that you, you went for a cheeky McDonald's maybe after the after the European final in, in Munich? It, it's you've obviously built up a relationship where it's 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 coach and, and athlete, but it's also a friendship now at this stage, I'd imagine. Yeah, the thing is, I think the coach athlete like relationship in any sport is vital, especially in, in sport, I guess, like athletics, where you know is is individual performance really. Um, I think it's such like a great like responsibility, you know, to be a coach, and you know, I have full trust in Daniel. Um, not gonna give me a freedom, I guess, to. Just to, not to worry about some certain things, and he kind of takes care of a lot of things for me and for our, group, our training group. And you know, I'm just able to just show up the training and do whatever session he has prescribed for me, and listen to any feedback he gives me, and try to improve on those things. Um, but yeah, after after the final in Munich, we got back to the hotel. Um, things were a bit um, hectic at the hotel, so we kind of snuck out to get a cheeky McDonald's. Um, and just we just talked for it was like what, one a.m. in the morning. We got back at like three or something for a couple hours, just talking. Were like different things, but um, as you said, like obviously, like we're coaching athlete, but we're also friends as well. And I remember, in McDonald's, just talking about like random stuff <laughs> that have nothing to do with the athletics. Um, but I think it is important to kind of have a coach that you trust and that you're able to, you know, kind of get to call your friend really. And I'm really blessed to, to have that. And, and and I guess even thinking before your your time with Daniel, you you would have had people like Jerry McArdle there in the dock who. Who obviously worked with you for years going up so you, I, i'm sure especially when you have moments like you did in munich you probably are, are triggered to remember those people the people that kind of helped you from from the very outset of your career you know 100 for sure like jeremy carl he's i still see him as one of my best friends and i see him as a mentor and i was i learned so much from him and to be able to like share it i i, I try to share this moment with him really meant a lot to me because you know, we if this, he's the one that kind of started everything really he kind of took me in um, I was a 15 year old and just kind of developed me, I guess, as an athlete and as a person, really, as well. And um, when I started with Jerry, we didn't really we just wanted to see how, like, we just want to see where things would go. We didn't really have any, um, I guess, ambitions of, you know, that would end up turning out like this. We just wanted to be the best, just be the best that we can be, really. And to see where things have gone really means a lot to me to be able to you know, look back and share this moment with him. Hey, tell me, Israel, about the about the burst spikes. This, this story kind of uh, popped up. Um, across your time in Munich, that you, you you seem to be bursting a couple of pairs of spikes, that which seems bizarre. It's like a golfer uh, breaking their club in half. Um, I'd imagine. So, uh, and it, it wasn't just one pair either. It was a couple of pairs. So that that was probably an indi- indication of how fast you were running. Yeah, I think this season I've gone through maybe like six pairs of spikes just from them bursting on me. Um, but yeah, like literally, I was doing my warm up before the final. I was actually doing my last run of my warm up. And I just felt I felt my I just felt the plate really. I heard a pop as well. And I turned back, I looked at Daniel, 
I gave him a smile. He already knew what happened because it's happened so many times this season. And um, but you just have to roll with it. Really, you can't really think too much about it. I didn't. There's nowhere to get an extra pair there because I already burst a spike earlier um, for the championship um, in Munich. Um, I burst a spike during my last training session, so I didn't have a spare pair. I just go with it and wear the the plated pair for the final. But I mean, this is part of the game. Really. You can't really think too much about that. Uh, that in the moment, you have to just get on with it. Really. So you managed to become Ireland's fastest man with a with a burst pair of spikes. Yeah, pretty much. That's, that's what I'm going to tell my kids for sure. Yeah. <laughs> it, it must have taken a couple of hundred seconds. You, you'd imagine off the the potential time you could have got, but at least you have a good excuse. And you can you can go again to break the record, I suppose. Yeah, that's the plan. I mean, we'll see we'll see what I can do with two proper functioning pairs of spikes. It's funny, like you you strike me as someone who 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 um. You know, you have a good head for it. You, you obviously downplay expectations. Like I, I remember you talking about, you know, in interviews before the championships in Munich, you, people were asking you, you know, whether you were, you wanted to make the semi final or the final or what your expectations were. And you, you know, you you were kind of so, talking about how your goal was just to to compete to the best of your abilities. So, are, are you just the type of person that doesn't really put a, a figure on it, a time or a, or a you know getting to a final? It's just compete and and feel good after it. I guess is the is the attitude. Um, I guess like. I would have maybe like before the season starts, I will have kind of time goals that I would I want to achieve, but that's even even those are they're pretty loose and it's just to I guess keep myself engaged, I guess, during the season like and, and all but I wouldn't I wouldn't, I wouldn't be too strict with it. Like I know like even with the time that's set, I can achieve like so much more as well. So I have I don't I wouldn't be too strict with I guess with the with, with the time I want to achieve. I just want to become the best I can become, you know. Um, just take each day one at a time, and just see the small improvements we can make to to guess to build a bigger picture. Yeah, I, I know you're studying in, in your in your final year at the moment, Israel, for your your computer science degree there in UCD. Um, like it must take quite a bit of balancing between you know the running and and your academic studies and and having a social life and dealing with you know with your family as well. Um, how have you managed to maintain that? I know obviously you're, I'm sure your family and Sport Ireland and, and the university are all key cogs in that, but. How do you find, because a lot of athletes we speak to talk about, you know, burnout being a serious issue. So how do you find managing all, all those different facets of your life? Yeah, there definitely is like, you know, kind of a lot to kind of try to fit in. But, you know, there is like a good, there's a lot of hours in the day. So I guess just like kind of managing your time well and set priorities really like, um, you know, when I'm training, I'm training, when I'm studying, I'm studying. I'm not kind of, I set time aside to kind of do guess both and as well time for myself to just to relax and to spend time with friends as well. So I think now, especially that I'm a friend of your now, but I'm also living on campus in UCD. I have way more time to kind of do the things I kind of need to do, especially. So, um, I mean, it is, it's a bit of a juggling act, but, you know, as you said, you know, I have a lot of support from, you know, my coach, my family, support Ireland, Alex Ireland, UCD as well, uh, to kind of, you know, just support me in any way I can. I know there was a lot of lot of controversy back in 2011. I, I remember when the the track closed down in UCD, the athletics track, and and then of course it was it was ripped up thereafter. But there's been a lot of good news over the last couple of weeks. We, we've had the a fairly significant donation from from a, a former past pupil, I think, an anonymous donation that has allowed this this new track to uh, to finally get there. So th- this must be a really exciting uh, time for all the athletes in UCD. Oh, yeah, 100. percent Like to have like a track that we can call our own really like means a lot to all of us and um yeah it's just it's great for the college for the club and for the community as well to have the track and it's just it's such a great facility and i was i was there for the opening day and just like seeing it actually be come to fruition after all of this time it really means a lot to all of us and it's a great facility it's a world-class track and um, it's really going to be do wonders for i guess sport in ireland like in general really um so really grateful for the donor i think it was three million um, that was donated to towards the track, and you know it's just it's a brilliant it's brilliant to have really. Um, like when you mentioned there talking about the you know the fact that it is a team thing as well. When 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 you look at Team Ireland going to these events and and really uh, exceeding expectations and doing fantastically well, what's it like for you when you're when you're at these events uh, like Munich where where you know you're you're watching other athletes as well like Rashid Adelecki and Kieran McGee and a, a couple of the big names at the moment. Like, uh, it must give you quite a bit of joy and, and satisfaction to watch. Your your fellow Irish teammates achieving as well in the big stage. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, I, I'm I'm a fan of the sport, so I love like actually being there at the track and being able to watch. You know, people that I know you know, do what they love, especially in person. You know, it's really great to see and kind of inspires you as well. You learn so much just from watching how other athletes just go about their business, not even just competing, just how they kind of act around the hotel and stuff like that. I'm learning so much from the older athletes and 
even the younger ones as well. And it's great because like over the last few years, you know, I've been going to these different championships and you know, seeing people like Rashida Abeleke as well, like we've been going to championships together since 7, 18 and kind of I guess growing together and it's great to see the kind of the heights that we're achieving there. And we know we're not done, we know there's so much more we can achieve and um yeah, it's just really great to see like and there's also the older athletes as well that you can kind of learn from and um draw tend to draw things from. So it's good. There's, there's a great mix in the Irish camp, I guess, moving forward of experience and youth. So um, I think the future definitely is bright for Irish athletics for sure. I know Rashida went down the the line of the NCAA and uh, joined the University of Texas and and racing over there in in, in North America. Like it, it, obviously you'll have your final year in UCD to complete first, but are you are you thinking that far ahead as to you know what comes next? Is it pro offer? Is it go to the NCAA? Or are you keeping your options open at this point? Yeah, I mean it's, it's not it's not that it's not that far into the future. I guess I, I'm, I'm I'll be done UCD in May, so then after that I'll kind of assess my options and see. I guess what would be the best off, best route for me to take to just to better my development as an athlete and as a person really. So I have a few options at the moment. So I'll take time over the next few weeks, you know, a few months to sit down with my family with my coach as well and just decide, you know, what would be best for us moving forward. It's the European indoors next, is it up for you in Israel next March or so, is it? Yeah, the European indoors will be uh, my next focus in Istanbul uh, in March. So I've already qualified for that. So now I can just focus on, I guess, just getting the best shape I can to produce the best performance um, that I can at the championship, for sure. Do you allow yourself to, to think ahead to, to the Olympics and give yourself targets, or is that just uh, too far ahead into the future to even worry about at the moment? I mean, it definitely is like a dream of mine to compete at the Olympics. It definitely is a target. But for now, I'm focused on just this winter of training, getting through it, um, just improving as much as I can really this winter, and then focus on European indoors, then for the outdoor season, European under 23s, and then World Championships, hopefully. And from there, we can focus on the 2024 season. I mentioned finally Israel at the, at the start of it as well. You're, you've been taking part this week in the, the, the SPAR College Fund and uh, promoting it as well. Third level students having the chance to win these two prizes of uh, 5,000 euro each uh, to support them across the academic year. Of course, uh, this year of all years with the rising cost of everything, it'd be a good year to, to win these. Um, so they've teamed up with yourself and Kian Mooney, the TikTok star, who a lot of people will be uh, familiar with. So... Uh, they have to record this TikTok video in their local spa in under 10.17 seconds, a time that, of course, means a lot to you. But uh, this is obviously a, a, a would be a huge thing for anyone to win, I'd imagine. Yeah, 100%. Like, it's for a great cause, you know, giving back to the students. You know, there's 10,000 euro up for grabs, um, two prizes of 5,000 euro each. So it really is for a great cause. You know, being a student, it's not it's not easy at all, especially financially. So um, for students to have the opportunity to win this from just from a bit of fun, really, you know, just making a TikTok. Just showing your local sport in 10 seconds or less. It's a bit, a bit of fun, a bit of crack. I think um, it's a great opportunity for um, for any student out there. I definitely would encourage you guys to get involved and to see um, if you can get the prize for sure. Well, listen, uh, if people want to find out more, they can they can visit uh, spar.ie, as I said. But uh, Israel, it's been a, an absolute pleasure to chat to you. No doubt we'll, we'll catch up again at some stage before the European indoors and uh, before the Olympics beyond that. So listen, appreciate your time this morning and um, up the town. Sure, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Good man. Israel Tunde, thanks a million. Yeah, pretty exciting stage of uh, of his career and his life. Um, still not quite sure if he's going to end up in the American collegiate system. Probably not. Maybe maybe yes. I don't know. He's. I think he's thinking, he's thinking about it. He certainly, the the attitude I got from him was that it's it's up in the air, maybe. Um, I know Rashid Adelecki, as we said, has done the University of Texas thing. She's gone to Austin, done that. Um, it's, it's probably a smart move. I mean, you're heading to the top of the game over in America. Uh, and obviously the Olympics on the on the horizon for for Israel as well. Uh, really impressive guy, and to be called Ireland's fastest man in history. I mean, it's not a bad tagline. Already, yeah, plenty more to come as well. Uh, right at nine thirty seven, a reminder that OTBAM is brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish today. Really busy program tomorrow. Shane alongside Adrian Barry in the hot seat. Man of the moment, Damien Brown is going to be in studio, following his historic row from New York to Galway. The man rode a boat from New York. To go away. We should just keep saying that, I think. F1 journalist Lee McKenzie will discuss her new book. Ron Nogara and Alan Quinlan will preview a big weekend of URC action and much more besides. Right now, we're going to leave you with some of last night's Wednesday Night Rugby, where Joe was joined by Keith Wood and Rory O'Connor. Enjoy. See you tomorrow. So, Wednesday Night Rugby, very happy to say Rory O'Connor of the Irish Independent here in studio. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. And sure. Mr. Keith Wood is with us, presumably from Killaloo. Hello. Hi, Joe. Great to have you with us. So, a few things going on. The weekend that was had wins for 
Leinster against Ulster, Munster beats Everett Parme and Connacht as we know lost in Pretoria and I suppose all eyes on Galway this Friday 4G pitch, Connacht against Munster, what Rory O'Connor has termed the desperation derby and it's actually caught on a little bit so I'm not sure the two teams love your marketing ploy but there's uh, something in it Got on. Oh, we've got to sell it somehow, don't we? So <laughs> it's the RC and early, it's still, still early October. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to stick with uh, it. Desperation points to hotly contested, I suppose. Well, it's, it's it, you know, I think Bernard Jackman was talking about it being, you know, if there was relegation in the league, it would be a relegation six pointer. Um, I don't think it's quite that bad, certainly from Munster's point of view. But where it does get tricky for both teams is if they want to be in the Champions Cup next year they've got to start winning games and because meritocracy is no longer applied in the URC top 8 position does not guarantee you European Champions Cup places as Glasgow found out to their cost last year because you're guaranteed one team from Wales one team from Ireland one team from South Africa and one team from either Scotland or Italy you have to start picking up points early 56 was what got Munster into Europe last year they were the last they were the lowest ranked team who didn't uh, top their conference essentially. So while it's early season, they've got six of a top of a possible fifteen, and they need to start winning very very soon. So that's why I moved into that territory. While also, you know, it's it's uh, just a, it was a good headline. <laughs> <laughs> well, to more sobering news, first of all, so numerous front pages, not just sports pages, but front pages of newspapers, I think, including your own, Rory, uh, led with this study from Scotland, which is deeply alarming, deeply concerning, deeply upsetting for all concerned with the game. Uh, rugby players, 15, one five, 15 times more likely to develop motor neuron disease versus the general population. So this was published yesterday in the Journal of Neurology, Neurosurgery and Psychiatry. In effect, the study compared 412 male former Scottish internationals against 1,200 people in the general populace and it was conducted by Willie Stewart of uh, University of Glasgow's man synonymous with this kind of work over the last number of years and so again the headline the frightening headline for anybody involved in rugby uh, these former Scottish internationals 15 times more likely to develop motor neuron disease versus the general population. They're also, by the way, two and a half times more likely of neurodegenerative disease generally than the um, general population. But that's obviously a good deal short of the 15 times when it comes to MND. So Willie Stewart doing interviews all over the media across the day. I was listening to him, for instance, on TalkSport, a station not prone to covering rugby union all that often. And he has said the numbers are, quote, a big surprise. And what was said in the publication is this is a further insight into the association between contact sports and neurodegenerative disease risk of particular concern, the data on motor neuron disease. And uh, really, they say this finding requires immediate research attention. So they're sending the klaxon and saying we need to get into this and find out what the hell is going on ASAP, more research ASAP. So Willie Stewart in interview said, I'm genuinely concerned about what's happening in the modern game. And if in 20 years time we repeat this study, that we would see something more concerning. Uh, Keith, not the first time this issue has arisen in uh, rugby, but I mean, those figures are utterly frightening for anybody concerned with the game. Yeah, they're pretty terrifying. And it's it's a reasonable sized study it isn't it isn't a tiny study um and the line that comes out of it that there needs to be more study done on it straight away is something that sticks out an awful lot i mean the the headline number is terrifying um and the idea of uh, of this being you know not taken fully seriously would be would be would be truly terrible for the sport so um like whatever has to be done to to gather more information for that has to be done and has to be done very very quickly um i had by coincidence i was with Jody weir um for the weekend in scotland and and as you know Jody was was diagnosed with motor neuron five years ago and um uh, he truly is a force of nature it's but it's incredibly debilitating um what he has managed to do in terms of highlighting the the, the issues uh, are pretty stark, and he has managed to fundraise a colossal amount of money with it. And his his drive, um, his mental fortitude is still absolutely there. But it's it's tough. It's very very tough. 
Um, I remember when we were doing a, a fundraiser at one stage a couple of years ago in, in Dublin, um, I had a conversation with um, with one of the researchers, one of the motor neuron uh, disease researchers, and um, and she had said that um, high energy activity had a correlation to higher numbers of motor neuron disease. And so the more studies that come out from this, the the I'm going to say the better, but we need to get to the to the root cause of them because we don't want to have this. It's it's such a debilita debilitating um, disease. We don't want to have any more of this. Of that number, fifteen times seems um, ludicrously large. So it's it's pretty terrifying. Yeah, it's hard to disagree with that. And it, I, what it does is it adds to what we already know about brain in injury and in rugby, and you know the CTE issue, which we've discussed in in here before. And Willie Stewart, who I've interviewed, is is a very impressive man. He comes at this, you know, from a scientific point of view. He he, he played amateur rugby. He he you know he he had a passion for the game. I think he's he's been quite disenfranchised by it in the last decade, he, and and is is unafraid to speak his mind when it comes to it. But he's also been backed up by his own research, and he's done great work in football as well in terms of heading the ball. And and it's, it's him that was behind that big study a couple of years ago. But same group of researchers, and he is sounding the alarm bells for the current game and we, we, we will talk about two things I think the current game and medical science is making advances and we're seeing players being stood down you know for, you know, out of concern for, for their well, well-being like Alex Candell in the Munster this week Caelan Doris is currently being stood down and that's something that would, wasn't happening when these players that were part of this study were, were playing we're seeing you know recognise or remove we're seeing HIAs the processes that are there are far, far greater, are far better and more, more stringent than what was there before, which was the Wild West, really, because people weren't thinking about this. It was having your bell rung, as we talked about that before. Culturally, and, sorry, and also the rules, the, the laws of the game are now set up to try and stamp this out, even if the players aren't adapting to it as quickly as we'd like. We're seeing a lot more red cards than we ever had before. And that is all moving in the in the way, in, in the direction of trying to, I'm sorry, contact training in, is, is being reduced on a massive rate basis. And Peter O'Reilly had that piece that you talked about in the pay-per-view on Sunday where he spent time at Leinster training and they spent 15 minutes, I think it was, yeah. between their entire week sessions doing contact and it's not it's not even full contact really. All of that is happening and the game is trying to make strides and fighting against it. And Willie Stewart is saying that it's not enough because the players are faster, the players are stronger and there's too many matches. And they're playing, you know, some of these players that were involved in the study weren't playing very frequently at all. They played a couple of matches a year. You know, it wasn't the same game. It wasn't played at the same intensity. We may speak later about the fact that the game is too slow, it's too stop-start, that it needs to be faster. Well, you've got these incredibly strong athletes running into each other all the time over the course of, you know, how many rooks is there per game? It's, you know, 100, 100 200 odd rooks, rooks in a game. Um, malls, scrums, all of those things, and it's leading to these impacts over and over again. These concussive, c concussive impacts, which we see when they're um, they're high profile, they're withdrawn, but also subconcussive impacts at a micro level that are building up over time. And it's that race that's going on. And what Willie Stewart is calling for is quite simple: remove contact from training, and reduce the number of games. And I think Keith will be in, has spoken about how he thinks there should be fewer games. I, I, I hope I'm not misquoting him on that. You you would increase the quality in that in in that way. But the economics of the game pull against that. And we're seeing Worcester go to the wall this week. We're seeing Wasps in, in trouble in, in England. And they would say we need more games because we need more bums on seats on a weekly basis. The broadcasters want games. They want something every week to fill their schedule from Friday evening until Sunday night. Everything's pulling in different directions and the players are getting lost in it. I think within Ireland, the, uh, the number of games that are played is so tightly controlled by the RFU. That's a good thing. We've seen examples... In, in the provinces of players Marky Moore was stood down at the end of last season Caelan Doris Johnny Sexton James Ryan at Leinster and now Kendallan at the moment at Munster have, have all been stood down at a time where they're needed you know Kendallan would have started last weekend sorry he'd be in Emerging Ireland on the Emerging Ireland tour so that's good to see yeah. and the things that Leinster are doing that you'd imagine are being replicated they're good to see as well but it's just whether the game as a whole, as a global thing, is, is able to pull together. It's not able to pull together on the other front. So how are we all going to pull together on this front? Willie Stewart, you, you was uh, speaking at length uh, over the last 24 hours. You've echoed some of the points he's made. So contact training during the week should be viewed as a thing of the past, is what he said. And that Peter O'Reilly week 
with Leinster behind the scenes was very encouraging on that front. 15 minutes is done a week, sometimes not even, and not in a concurrent 15 minute spell. It might be five minutes one day and 10 minutes another day. And Lancaster was absolutely emphatic in saying, we're virtually never at level three, we're at level two, which is non-contact, and that's all we need to do. So if that's replicated everywhere, and I don't know if it is or isn't, I don't know what's happening in premiership training or the other provinces, but let's assume that's implementable in a relative sh short period of time. Box that off is done. What Stuart is also saying, Keith, and Rory mentioned this, is the number of games. So he says, instead of talking about extending seasons and introducing new competitions and global seasons, they should be talking about restricting it as much as possible, cutting back on the amount of rugby we are seeing, getting rid of as much training as possible, look at the number of matches being played and ask, is this credible that young men and women can be playing week in, week out for the majority of the year just for entertainment? I know it's tough to think about there being less rugby rather than more. Yeah, I look, it makes it, it makes an incredibly awkward conversation, a very, very difficult conversation. I mean, I'm... Um, you know, you, you quoted me correctly, uh, Rory. I, I was trying to say that um, there's a constant push to try and make the game bigger, as in more matches, more leagues go into other places. Um, rugby is, it's a big sport, but it's nothing like football. And um, I think we continually kind of manoeuvre along the lines as if the economics that are involved with football will somehow relate to the economics in rugby. And whereas the only place that that seems to fit at all seems to be in France, maybe Japan, even within England, uh, there was a, a report during the week just on the pure economics of it, of how much in a whole all the clubs were. Now, the reason that they're not all struggling is because they've been funded by somebody who's been willing to pay um, to pay the amount of the shortfall every year. So the turnover of these as businesses needs to be an awful lot better um, or the players' salaries have to be cut very significantly. And in some respects, the salaries would have to be cut as a business. But, you know, you, I don't know that you want to say to, to guys that for what you're putting your body through, you should be paid less, you know. So it's one of those very un, kind of uncomfortable type of, of conversation. Mm. But for me, the game is just extended too long in the year. Um, there isn't a, a definable off season really, because actually there's tours in all the off seasons. So pretty much you end up with six weeks, but the amount of recovery level is, is, um, is not quite there. It isn't as defined as you'd like it to be because it never really, um, had a coordinated uh, approach towards what professional rugby would be once the game went open in 96. Yeah. So if it had been all tied into um, to the unions, then it might have been looked at very differently. But now there is different people own different rights. And because of that, they have put a lot of money in towards it. So they're looking from, it, from that perspective. Um, but for me, for the enjoyment of playing, and I'm long since playing, I'm nearly 20 years retired. So that idea of wanting to play every week, of course we wanted to play every week, but you do want to have an end of a season. So if there's any way of tidying it up, it may come down to the idea that uh, health and safety grounds may be the forcing mechanism for mm. a restructuring of the game. But... Like it's just it's just disturbing to 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 um to to read those reports and look all those reports need to be fully uh, verified they need to be brought up and they need more research to go on on the back of it the headline figure on all of them is terrifying so um, when you're then looking at and we've talked about ex existential issues with the game and most of them have been financial well these are health ones and. You know, it's, it's yes, it's entertainment. Yes, it's a job. Um, yes, this fits the bill for in different elements. And we've discussed NFL in the past as to whether we'd go down that model of 17, 16, 17 matches regular season. Um, the game isn't viable financially at the moment. And this is just going back to the finances. It's not. So how it's structured requires huge, a large number of people to put huge amounts of money in to bolster clubs in the UK 
Um, we manage it in Ireland by the IRFU bolstering the provinces. Um, it's one big pot. The provinces actually own the IRFU, so it all kind of fits in a in a strange fashion. But it does work within Ireland. It doesn't work in an awful lot of other com- countries. So yeah. um, I don't like. I don't know. It's it's one of those things where you're sitting down and saying, "God, this is a, a horrible moment in time." Um, for anybody that's afflicted by any of the impacts of the game. Um, And then you have a sport and entertainment business that is on the edge and has been on the edge for for a little while now. Steve Thompson, who uh, needs no introduction on a chat like this, he has a documentary airing this evening on BBC, Prime Time. It will have millions of viewers. And Keith Wood talked there about the... um, the terrifying headlines, these are mainstream headlines. So rugby faces existential threats financially and with health and safety in mind. It will face a very immediate and potentially very sudden existential threat in the area of participation because, as Keith says, you need deeper research and that will take time. But in the short term, mums and dads all over Ireland, all over the UK, will say no smoke without fire, no chance. Just no chance. And Bernard Jackman was on the paper review recently and he was talking about, you know, uh, less elite levels being less dangerous and and, and absolutely I I would take his perspective on that. But he did also describe it at underage level or different levels that he's coaching at now. Increasingly, there are the group partaking in full contact training and and, uh, training as would have happened over the previous decades. And increasingly, there is a a group to the side who are non-contact. Now, that group's going to get bigger. And again, it's like a three-pronged financial, health and safety, and then participation. Now, this is really existential, and this can happen so quickly. Like 15 years, tap can be turned off here. Absolutely, and I think that's where the tipping points may come in terms of the unions waking up to the fact that they have to change because they can talk about change and they can... You know, like, like I understand you need as much information as possible to make these decisions, but these are real time issues. And while the most important um, part of this is the people involved's health, there is a perception battle as well and a PR battle. And that PR battle, um, I mean, the, the information that's being put out there, and it's you know, it's it's coming from good sources and it's it's real. And Steve Thompson's testimony and and the testimony of. Of, of the players who've spoken to David Walsh in the Sunday Times, like Ryan Jones and the, the parents of Siobhan Cadigan, like one of the most harrowing, brilliant pieces of journalism, but also harrowing pieces of journalism I've ever read. Um, that all feeds into the decision as to what I'm going to send my child to do on a Saturday or Sunday or whether I'm going to allow them go to rugby training after school. And that's where the next generation will come from. And and I'm anecdotally aware in, in the WhatsApp groups of my friends and I've got a two-year-old. My friends will all have kids of a different, you know, between you know two and ten. Some of them have their kids playing rugby. Some of them wouldn't let them be be seen dead, and it's something that myself and my wife will will have to discuss before we go there. And I have to listen to what she thinks, and and I have things. I have reservations. I also see the benefits. I know what it did for me. I played amateur, not very amateur rugby, not very well for twenty years, and it was a very important part of my life. It's given me my job, and I love the sport. Mm. But I see the, the 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 drawbacks as well, and and I think there's already a participation crisis at um, amateur level below kind of your professional game. I think the number of teams that compete at each club is is compressing all the time. The RFU have brought in a kind of a, a touch scheme to try and keep people just playing some form of the game in in England because after COVID in particular, a lot of lads who have just been getting injured playing rugby, whether it's their head or their shoulders, and you know I've been missing work. I've just said I'm not. This is yeah. not what I want to spend my weekend doing, but. It's when because minis rugby has been what's keeping clubs uh, going, and you know, in terms of like the numbers. If you go to any, you know, if you go to Belvo, Lansdowne on a Saturday in, in Dublin, it's the hundreds of kids on the pitch that are kind of keeping the place thriving. If, if you know, that's and that's where the game has started. They see Johnny Sexton play on a Saturday, they want to play it themselves. Um, yeah, that is where I think the tipping point will come if those numbers start to dwindle. If the schools are struggling to field teams, then they'll have to change because there won't be any future for the game. We're not at that point yet. People still seem to want yeah. to let their kids play, but I do think a lot of people are, are asking the question and wondering whether it's they'd be better off sending them down to the GA club or the soccer club. Yeah. Uh, Keith, last one on this before we move on to matters more on the field. I mean, people I'm sure will be aware that uh, 
rugby is, you know, part of your family's life and, and you'd be very involved in the community. Do you hear concerns from parents or has it, has it filtered down to that level? Um, I think everybody's discussing it. I, I don't know. Look, I do think the numbers are dropping off um, at, at different degrees. And, and a lot of that did come after COVID. Um, and a lot of the, it's it's funny, or not funny, but it's uh, a lot of people who weren't able to train or play a huge amount during COVID, a lot picked up injuries soon after coming back. And we're not talking the injuries that we've been discussing earlier. So, um, I, I do think um, a lot of participation sport has taken a bit of time to come back. Some of the more 